perfect New York evening, but tension was rising as game one was ready to bust loose. A night of redemption here in game one. The Padres pondered an early two-run deficit, but Greg Vaughn reached out and delivered an opposite field declaration. Greg Vaughn goes deep into right center field. And with ace Kevin Brown, the Padres controlled the momentum. Then the man with the golden bat stepped up. Tony Gwynn can stand tall in the house of Gotham's Giants. It seemed Padre power would prevail. But on this night to remember, redemption would rule supreme in the seventh. Now hitting number 11, Chuck Nabla. Tino Martinez would have his moment to shine. Although game one didn't deliver on its pitching dual promise, two men put the past aside as they look to make the future last. Now, with game two upon us, the Padres must win as right-hander Andy Ashby searches for the answer. But El Duque digs in, and this man has no fear of the fall classic. Next, game two of the World Series on Fox. The E-Trade World Series pregame show is brought to you by E-Trade, the number one rated place to invest online. It's a gorgeous night for baseball at Yankee Stadium, and the postseason has always been unlikely hero time. And who in New York would have thought that Tino Martinez and Chuck Knobloch would have been the heroes of Game 1 for New York? Their power offset the blasts of Greg Vaughn and Tony Gwynn, and the Yankees came back to win Game 1 of the 1998 World Series, setting the stage for El Duque, Orlando Hernandez, and the Yankees in Game 2 tonight here on Fox. Hello again, everybody. I'm Chip Carey. Welcome to the World Series and the E-Trade World Series pregame show here on Fox. As always, I'm joined by my partner, Steve Psycho Lions won a great ball game last night. The Padres had the lead. They had their ace, Kevin Brown, on the mound, but they couldn't seal the deal. The Yankees came back and won game one. And the Padres absolutely feel like they let one slip away from them. This was a game they probably should have won. They had Kevin Brown on the mound, 5-2 to two lead. He started that game with a sinus infection. He said he probably shouldn't have started at all. He was gassed when the game started. By the fifth, he had nothing. And then this ball off of Chili Davis's bat hit him in the shin. The Padres actually thought that he may have had a broken leg at one period in, in that game. Brown kept pitching until he couldn't go anymore, and then the bullpen couldn't hold it for him. Yankee fans were delighted over what happened in the seventh inning with Tino Martinez and Mark Langston. Padre fans weren't too thrilled. Not so much with the home run, but the pitches that let the home run take place. Of course, Tino Martinez hit the grand slam on a 3-2 pitch. He crushed it into the upper deck. That gave the Yankees a four-run lead. But a lot of Padre fans, and really a lot of fans in New York, thought Richie Garcia may have missed a strike three call. Well, let's set up that at-bat. There's the strike zone. First pitch from Langston was a breaking ball away for a ball. Second pitch, high fastball out of the zone. Then Langston comes back with a fastball in the outside corner for a strike. You can see it within the zone. Then Tino fouls one off. Now the 2-2. Looks like a pretty good pitch. In fact, that is strike one. That pitch is ball three. Pretty questionable. The big problem, the next pitch. Two outs, bases drunk, full count, and the ball's in the seats for a grand slam home run. Now, a lot of people have been talking about that pitch, thinking it's a big controversy. They ought to stop talking about it. It wasn't that pitch that beat the Padres. It was the next one that ended up in the seats. Richie Garcia called 318 pitches in that game. Maybe he missed one. But there was eight guys in that Padre lineup that went one for four or worse in the game. And there was a, a saying that my dad used to tell me early in my career as a kid. He said, an umpire will never beat you. I believe that to be true. Richie Garcia did not beat the Padres. They just didn't win it for themselves. And hey, how about Mark Langston? He said himself, I didn't execute. And that's why Tina Martinez hit the grand slam. Langston is absolutely right about that. So into game two, Spray is tossed Andy Ashby, a man that really has turned his second half of the season around with great pitching performances against the Astros and the Atlanta Braves. Which Andy Ashby will we see? The Andy Ashby that went 16 and 6 at the start of the season or the Andy Ashby that struggled so badly in the second half of the regular season? Padres are hoping it'll be the Ashby that was a Cy Young candidate. And they know all too well about the atmosphere of Yankee Stadium and Ashby knows how that can affect a pitcher. Playing in the stadium, I heard it gets awful loud and and uh, 
very, very crazy at some times, but you know, you have to shut it out and do what you have to do on the field and, and let all that take care of itself. But, you know, like I said, the, the main thing is go out and try and do your job and not think about, you know, it's going to be hard not to think, well, you're pitching the World Series because this is what you play the game for. But if I can go out and control my emotions early and get kind of settled in and, and uh, do what I have to do and keep it close where I have a chance to win, then I feel uh, very comfortable that we can go out and do that. Maybe the biggest start for Andy Ashby in his major league career. The Padres don't want to go back home in a two games to none hole. Well, this is a huge start for Andy Ashby, but he's always had great stuff in the National League. His problem was the fact that he didn't really have the heart or the attitude. That's what Dave Stewart has added to his game. Stewart keeps a close eye on him. That's the biggest difference between Ashby's previous seasons and this one. And something else the Padres need is not only a great start from Ashby, but Trevor Hoffman in the ball game with the lead. That's something they did not have happen in game one. El Duque, Orlando Hernandez, what a story this man is. A refugee from Cuba making a World Series start. You'll meet him when we continue on the E-Trade pregame show after this. All here at Yankee Stadium, welcome back to the E-Trade World Series pregame show as we get set for game two between the Padres and the Yankees. Hi again, everybody. Chip Carey along with Steve Psycho Alliance. One of the great stories of this postseason is the mystery man for the Yankees, Orlando El Duque Hernandez, a man that fled the oppression of his homeland of Cuba, floated it to freedom, and now finds himself pitching in game two of the World Series. Let's meet him now. He is a product of sports and politics, a Cuban legend that represented a country whose mask of self-esteem is the game of baseball. His island baseball career came to an end soon after his half-brother, last year's World Series MVP, Levon Hernandez, defected in 1995. After two years of being banned from the game he loved, Hernandez decided the only way to survive emotionally and economically was to wager freedom against danger. Hold on, hold on to yourself, for this is gonna hurt like hell. Unsure if he'll ever see his family again, Hernandez left Cuba, gambling clandestinely in a weathered boat. Instead of surviving rough innings, El Duque had to survive rough seas, hunger, and shark-infested waters. Physically on the boat, we had a little bit of fear. All we could do is ask God to, to guide us, as he did. The boat landed safely in the Bahamas, and he became an instant baseball intrigue. I don't think any of us know how old he is. We really don't care. 28. 28? 29. No, he was signed by the Yankees and had success in what seemed to be a New York minute. Still, El Duque appeared withdrawn and sullen. I could be thinking about baseball. I could be thinking about my daughter. No, I'm serious. I'm sometimes happy inside, but I just have a serious form to, to me. In the beginning, uh, he would try to get away from everybody, but right now, we, uh, he started the beginning to to know me, I start the beginning to know him, so we have a great relation right now. Yes, I mean. I speak to my family regularly, and I've been able to grow a lot these past two years without baseball. Also, grow a lot now that I'm here in the States, and my family's in Cuba. But my eight-year-old daughter, she helps me along the way because she tells me, Dad, I know why you're not here. I know why you're there. It's because you want to play baseball, and you have to play baseball to raise a family. So that helps me to get along. But because of language barriers, his messages don't always come across clearly. He likes to rag on you different, you know, obviously a different language, and, and then you just look at him like, what? And he thinks he gets you. He's laughing at you. Got to find somebody around here to, to translate for him. By that time, it's, it's all over. He's dying, on, laying on the ground, laughing at you. It's terrible. I must be angry. Well, he may be a man of mystery, but there's no mystery about what he did for the Yankees. He had a great rookie season, and if you're worried about pressure and how he's going to react to that, remember, he floated for freedom and for his life in coming to America. Now yeah, that's pressure. This is not pressure. This is just going to be a lot of fun for the kid. And remember, the Yankees win game one. He goes out there with all that flair, all those knees and everything he throws at you. He's a good pitcher. He can get it done with a lot less pressure on him. There are those who say, though, that he does have a weakness, and that is against left-handed batters. You buy that? Yes, he does, and that's why Bruce Bochy has loaded up that lineup with a bunch of lefties, seven of them. Vaughn is the DH in that lineup. Lefties hit 100 points higher in the lineup than do right-handed hitters against him, and that's why you see so many. The only problem that does possess... 
present itself for Bochy is the fact that if there's a pitching change, then he might have to make some changes in his lineup. So as we get set for game two, Steve, your final thoughts. This is obviously a huge game for the Padres, especially the way game one went to the Yankees. The Padres don't want to go home down two games to none, but how do you react emotionally to a loss like the one they suffered last night? Well, it was really tough, but you got to be able to make a comeback situation for the Padres as Andy Ashby has to throw some goose eggs up on the scoreboard very early, settle down, take this Yankee crowd out of the game, and then for those left-handed hitters in the lineup, they have to do what they're supposed to do, score some runs, and make sure they get ahead in this game, get to Hoffman. Well, folks, have fun adjusting your volume dial at home as we get set for game two of the World Series. The Yankee Stadium is rocking. When we come back, Robert Merrill will have our national anthem, we'll have our first pitch, and then it'll be game two of the Fall Classic coming up right here on Fox. Two of the 1998 World Series between the Padres and the Yankees. Let's send it upstairs to the legendary PA voice of the Yankees, Bob Shepard, for our pregame introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please rise? We direct your attention now to the area behind home plate. And introducing once again, Mr. Robert Merrill. Join me lustily to sing our national anthem. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed? At the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars throw the perilous fight. For the rough hearts we watched was so gallantly streaming, and the rockies red glow, the bombs bursting in air, yet through through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the with our national anthem here at Yankee Stadium. Of course, Yankee Stadium, one of the crown jewels in all of baseball, and its most special feature is Monument Park. And in the 1998 season, the home run chase of Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa, the Maris family was on hand. They got a chance to see their father's monument in center field. Ladies and gentlemen, throwing out tonight's Ceremonial first pitch are six cherished members of the Yankee family. This summer, the home run chase by Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa allowed the country to celebrate the great accomplishments of Roger Maris. Joining us tonight, to honor their father, please welcome the Maris children, Sandra, Kevin, Richard, Randy, Susan, and Roger Jr. And it's great to see the Maris family back home here at Yankee Stadium. Stay tuned. Joe Buck, Tim McCarver, and Bob Renly will have game two of the World Series after this timeout. 
Welcome back to the Bronx for the start of game number two of the 1998 World Series, the San Diego Padres and the New York Yankees. And welcome to the broadcast booth, everyone. I'm Joe Buck. The guys will join me in just a moment. Last night, we came on the air before game one and talked about a couple of question marks surrounding the Yankee offense. What do they do? They get two big home runs, one hit by Chuck Knobloch, the grand slam from Tino Martinez. And as I welcome in my partners, Tim McCarver and Bob Brenly, uh, Tim, this Yankee team won 114 games. They did hit over 200 home runs as a team, but for Joe Torre, it's still more of a get them on, get them over, get them in offense. Yeah, Joe, it's a lineup that's aggressive in the strike zone, patient on balls just out of the strike zone. They don't swing in a lot of bad balls. They run a lot of deep counts. They have a leadoff man's mentality, and it's understandable. Nine of the players on the Yankees roster were leadoff men. Tim Raines, of course, leading the group. Bernie Williams, the cleanup batter, in tonight's game with 245 games as a leadoff batter. They've had only five complete games thrown against them this year, and no wonder they just wear that starting pitcher out. Which was bad news last night for the San Diego Padres and starter Kevin Brown. They wear him down. They get into the long relief court for the Padres, and that's what coughed up the lead last night for San Diego. Now that ability to run up those pitch counts has exposed a weakness that the Padres probably didn't even realize they had. Their bullpen was very strong during the regular season, ranked fourth in the National League, but look what's happened in the postseason. With the exception of Trevor Hoffman, the Padres' bullpen has been ineffective at best. In a perfect world, Bruce Bochy would get eight innings out of his starter and just hand the ball to Trevor Hoffman, but because of the high pitch count that we anticipate tonight from the Yankee offense, he's going to have to go to the middle relief, and that spelled trouble in the postseason. Tonight's starter for the San Diego Padres, right-hander Andy Ashby, will be opposed by the right-hander Orlando El Duque Hernandez for the Yankees. New York up one game to none. Game two comes your way from Yankee Stadium right after this quick timeout. Welcome back to Yankee Stadium. We await the Yankees entrance to the field and now here they come the Yankees who won last night's game game one nine to six over San Diego hit the field led there by their left fielder rookie Ricky Lede and right in the heart of the diamond the right hander El Duque Orlando Hernandez a look at the Coors Light starting lineup for the San Diego Padres Gilby Olveris leads off at second base. Tony Gwynn bat second in right field with the DH tonight. Greg Vaughn homer twice here last night in consecutive plate appearances. Ken Caminetti cleans up with Wally Joyner at first. Steve Finley in center field with John Vanderwall in left. Greg Myers his first start in his history in the postseason behind the plate here in game number two. And Chris Gomez at short batting night. The Yankee defense with Chuck Knobloch highlighted. At second base, he made an error here last night. And he has committed two errors in this postseason. It is the same defense for Joe Torre, different man on the mound. Last night, David Wells. Tonight, the right-hander, El Duque, Orlando Hernandez. A guy who is fun to watch and hard to hit. That high leg kick, very deceptive. What El Duque did, he came up with a good four-seam fastball to confront left-handed batters. That was illustrated in his 4-0 win over the Cleveland Indians and the pitching to Jim Tomey and David Justice. He's a trickster who knows how to hide the ball, partially because of that high leg kick. So the right-hander, anywhere from 25 to 35 years old. <laughs> in that range. He's in some demographic. Right. We don't know. Well, both managers spoke of his ability to hide the baseball, Tim. As you mentioned, he's not overpowering with this fastball, but because hitters pick it up so late, it appears to be much quicker than it really is. Well, El Duque pitched what was a crucial game for the Yankees for Joe Torre in Game 4 of the American League Championship Series. Here are Joe Torre's thoughts on observing El Duque during the day before that start. It was so incredible the magnitude that game held for us and, and I watched him at brunch that day. Okay. This is we're down two games to one and he's out there serving people food and he's picking plates up. I said wow. I said I'm not sure if we're going to win but I know he's not going to be afraid and he pitched a uh, sterling uh, performance. Be serving up something different tonight. 
That Sterling performance, he went seven innings, allowed no runs on three hits. The Yankees were down two games to one, if you remember. Even the series at 2 2 and went on to win in six games over the Cleveland Indians. As always, this broadcast is also available in Spanish by utilizing the SAP button on your television. We will get into the story of Orlando Hernandez, detailed so well during the pregame show. As Kilvio Veras leads it off for San Diego with Tony Gwynn and Greg Vaughn to follow. Pitch one of game number two. A strike to Kilvio Veras. Hernandez from Villa Clara, Cuba. Big breaking ball for strike two. I think he wants a fastball. He was shaking for location. Usually if a pitcher shakes yes, no, yes, it's a fastball. Still 0-2. And, and Hernandez has a reputation of being a very deliberate worker, so I'm sure we'll see a lot of that throughout the course of the game tonight. Calling the balls and strikes, Mark Hirschbeck behind the plate, representing the National League, joined by that crew here in game two. Goes after Kilvio Veras with a first pitch fastball to get ahead, start the ball game, comes back with a nice overhand curve, very tight spin. Veras able to foul off a heater on the outside corner and then a shorter, sharper breaking ball for strike three. Strikeout number one for Hernandez and we mentioned last night they have different ways of tracking strikeouts here at Yankee Stadium as Gwynn first pitch swinging dumps a base hit into left field. So adept at going the other way and Gwynn who got his first hit here last night going to left goes to left here and played on one bounce by Ricky Lede. Tony Gwynn quiet in the league championship series batting only 190 but four for five here at Yankee Stadium first pitch high fastball classic Gwynn stroke to left. Why does it seem like the ball takes so long to get to Tony Gwynn? It seems like he's waiting to hit the ball for a long time. The ball just looks bigger to him, doesn't it? <laughs> so Gwynn is on at first with one out. And the batter is Greg Vaughn. You mentioned last night Vaughn last year failed a physical. And the trade was reversed. Greg Vaughn was sent back to San Diego. What did he do this year? A career year 50 home runs 119 driven in he hit two home runs in game one. One ball one strike. David Wells got the victory here last night. He's now won six consecutive postseason starts. Not his typical dominant self though seven innings five runs on seven hits last night but he got the victory. Long right past Vaughn strike two. Greg Vaughn swinging well under those two high fastballs. See that bat comes right underneath that pitch a little ride on that fastball it doesn't really rise but it doesn't sink at all it holds path all the way to the catcher. Two and two. Now the Yankees can't complain about that knee high fastball, not after last night. The pitch, the 2 2 pitch to Tino Martinez. That ball was low. Good call by Hurstbeck. Dropping down a little bit. Who doesn't have multiple arm angles on this Yankee staff. David Cohn enhanced. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. And Kevin Brown for the Padres last night. You know it's been a long time since you've seen pitchers that were willing to do this. They're all so concerned with their mechanics and their arm angle and this and that. 
it's kind of refreshing to see a pitcher that'll go out there and invent things from time to time. Good swing by Vaughn. It stays full three and two. Oh, I like it. Actually, not that high on that particular delivery. I guess you'd call that very low three quarters. Not quite sidearm, but approaching sidearm with that delivery. Hernandez is ready. A walk to Vaughn, and it's two on with only one out for San Diego here in the first inning. Vera struck out, Gwynn singled, Vaughn worked a walk. And now the cleanup hitter, Ken Caminiti, who was 0 for 3 here last night, walks to the plate. Both home runs for Caminiti this postseason have come while batting left handed. And he bats with Gwynn at second and Vaughn at first. As the Padres look for a quick start here in game two. Well, last night against the left hander David Wells, the Yankees worked Caminiti away early in the count and then tried to pound him in later in the count. Jose Cardinal just brought Ricky Lede in a few steps in left field. Strike one to Caminiti. And if you think that's not important, we'll take you back to game of the 1996 World Series when Jose Cardinal moved Paul O'Neill to his right about three steps to track down a ball hit by Luis Polonia for the last out of the game. That game won by Andy Pettit, one to nothing. Strike two on Caminiti. Which is usually a coach on every ball club that's responsible for positioning the outfielders, and they use the charts studying tendencies of hitters throughout the regular season but after you've been positioned many times outfielders don't move with the count which is very important as well when the pitchers ahead in the count the batter's more likely to be defensive and hit the ball to the opposite field when the hitters ahead in the count he's more likely to pull the ball When Mariano Rivera came in the game last night, we mentioned that the Padres had not seen a pitcher quite like Rivera. Well, they haven't seen a pitcher quite like Hernandez either. Nobody in the National League throws from this many arm angles and has this many pitches to get guys out on. I guess the closest would be Kevin Brown of the Padres, their teammate. Now two on with two on for Wally Joyner. Ball up and away. So Joyner now with a chance to put San Diego out in front. 298 hitter during the regular season. He was 0 for 3 here last night. Duque, the Duke. Some imaginative and inventive fans around here as they track the strikeouts too. Joyner off the end of the bat into deep right. O'Neill makes the catch to end the inning. Joyner didn't get all of it, and it cost him and the Padres as O'Neill went up the wall and brought back out number three here in the top of the first. Bottom of the first, Yankees bat, no score. Back at Yankee Stadium, Andy Ashby and the Padres head to work in the field and a look at the Coors Light starting lineup for the New York Yankees. Chuck Knobloch, one hero last night, leads off at second base. Derek Jeter bats second at short. Paul O'Neill hits third in right field. He's already made a good catch. Bernie Williams cleans up in center. Chili Davis is the DH tonight with Tino Martinez who hit the grand slam. Finally broke through in the postseason for the Yankees here last night. He's at first with Brocious at third, Posada catching, and Ricky Lede, the 24-year-old rookie, in left field batting ninth. To look at the Padre defense, we highlight Caminiti. Three consecutive Gold Glove awards for Caminiti at third. He's got a great arm. And the right-hander, who also has a pretty good arm, is Andy Ashby. Good look at his numbers in the postseason. Ashby has really learned intensity and focus under pitching coach Dave Stewart, a guy whose mind tended to wander at times early in his career. Dave Stewart has definitely changed the look of this Padres pitching staff, at least their own mental outlook as they take that mound. Chuck Knobloch 
as that one important home run in this postseason digs in takes a strike. You remember it was Andy Ashby in game one of the NLCS pitching so well matching up against John Smoltz. He didn't get the victory but the Padres eventually did in the 10th inning. And then Ashby pitched well in game five. Game the Padres had a late inning lead. Bullpen gave it up including Kevin Brown. The pop up behind the plate for Greg Myers. Long run and he can't hang on. It's strike number two on Chuck Nablock. That's a nice try by Greg Myers. He's sliding with all that equipment on. That's what outfielders often do. The ball in the glove and it came out. This is a uh, behind home plate. It is padded and you don't necessarily have to slide to make that play. But generally speaking that's the best way to handle it. That way you don't bang up the thighs and the torso. Bruce Bochy a former catcher. A backup catcher for the Padres when they were in the World Series in 1984. He gives one of his backup catchers a start here tonight in game two. Ball and two strikes on Nabla. Well, the idea against El Duque is to load up with as many left handed hitters in your lineup as possible. Greg Myers a left handed bat with some power getting an opportunity to start tonight and catch Andy Ashby. One and two on Nabla first up for the Yankees in the first. Foul. Knobloch wasn't willing to talk about redemption after the game last night, visiting with Chip Carey, the end of our telecast, but in many ways it was. Granted, when he came back from Cleveland as the Yankees played game six here at Yankee Stadium, the crowd gave him an ovation when he was announced and when he took the field, but it had a little more meaning to it last night when he tied the game in the seventh inning with a three run homer. A ball and two strikes two and two now from Ashby. Yankee fans forgave Chuck Knobloch like the Chicago Cub fans forgave Brown Brant Brown for that drop fly ball in Milwaukee the last week of the season and the Cubs going overtime to beat the San Francisco Giants in game 163 to win the wild card berth in the National League playoff. Two two to Knobloch. Chuck stays alive. Hey, remember last night Carlos Hernandez had white fingernail polish on. Greg Myers has tape on the index finger and probably the rest of the fingers I would assume to make it a little easier for Andy Ashby to see the signs. Team manicurist went back to San Diego <laughs> to get ready for the series out there so it's just tape tonight. Two balls two strikes. Full count as Knobloch battles Ashby. It was 0 and 2. It's now 3 and 2. And this is that typical leadoff man mentality that the Yankees have. The deep count, six pitches already to Knobloch. On 3 and 2. Knobloch walks. What a good at bat. For the veteran second baseman, and he's on to start the first inning for the Yankees. Well, those hitters that are able to lay off pitches out of the strike zone and fight off the tough pitcher's pitches, foul them off and force that pitcher to continue to work, and you see the result. That's uh, what a lot of major league hitters are not willing to do. Take a strike, get in the hole, be defensive, and work the count. So Knobloch took the first strike and the last ball in that at bat. Here's Derek Jeter. A leadoff walk to Knobloch. O'Neill will follow Jeter and then Bernie Williams. As now Andy Ashby tries to pitch around a leadoff walk. Knobloch during the regular season stole 31. He has yet to steal a base in this postseason. Signaling Willie Randolph to go through the signs again. Jeter looking at both Randolph and Knobloch as Chuck stays put. The pitch is low. Ball one to Jeter. A lot of things Joe Torrey can do right here. Certainly the hit and run with the count in Jeter's favor is one option.
One ball, no strikes. Knoblock at first with nobody out. He starts swinging a miss. Throw the second is off the mark. And Knoblock has his first stolen base of this postseason. Looked like a good throw might get him, but Myers did not get much on that toss down to second. You give yourself two chances with a guy with speed on at first base. Myers did not have a good pitch to handle. The ball got hung up in the web, and Knobloch has a stolen base. Yeah, it looked like Myers never really had a good grip on that ball before unloading it to second base. Caused the ball to sail a little bit, tail away from the bag. Knobloch able to get in ahead of it. And a runner at second with nobody out for New York as Jeter hits a comebacker. Ashby looks back at Knobloch and gets the out. One away, and Jeter did not advance the runner. That'll bring in Paul O'Neill. Who went up the wall on the ball hit by Joyner. Two on, two out, and this catch ended the top of the first. But Paul O'Neill does not get enough credit for his defense out there in right field. One of the best in the game. Able to go back on the ball, charge hard on balls hit in front of him. Very accurate, strong throwing arm. And just another great play there by Paul O'Neill. It's kind of the new old reliable around here for the Yankees. To go along with what you're saying, Bob. And he has re upped another contract, signed past this year now, and he bats with Knobloch at second, one out. He goes the other way. Caminetti with that good arm. High throw, safe, and here comes Knobloch. Joiner's thrown on made one to nothing, Yankees. Because Ken Caminetti went back on the ball, he wasn't able to plan his feet and throwing it off balance off that back foot. A hurried throw that is high, and Joyner, even though he got a glove on it, allows it to trickle away. O'Neill does not advance, but Knobloch does. It's unusual to see Ken Caminiti make a throwing error. Such a strong arm, but as you mentioned, Tim, his momentum was taking him towards the foul line, away from the play, not able to get as much on that throw as he normally does. So Knobloch with the battle for the leadoff walk, steals second, and scores on that error, which is how it's ruled by Caminiti. No RBI for O'Neill. It's one to nothing, Yankees, and the first is Bernie Williams' bats. Many times as a third baseman and a left-handed batter at the plate, you get caught by surprise sometimes when they hit a ball to your right. It's not unusual for a left-handed hitter to shoot that 5.5 Tony Gwynn hole on the left side of the infield, but not too many lefties go right down the third base line. Bernie Williams takes ball one. Tino Martinez, one of the heroes here last night for the Yankees. Part of the order now for the Yankees already leading by one. Now O'Neill's running on a hit and run. Ashby knocks it down. Gets Williams at first and down to second O'Neill two out. What you're seeing here in the first inning is the Joe Torrey style of play that he brought from the National League. Get them on, get them over, get them in. The Yankees have not hit a ball out of the infield. They have one run already scored and another runner in scoring position. What a lot of people talked about back in 1996 when Joe Torre first got here and we've seen more and more American League clubs follow suit. But I don't know that any team in the American League does that any better than the Yankees. As O'Neill takes his lead at second with two out for Chili Davis. A little low and a look at Ashby in the play from catcher camp. See that pitch on the outside corner. Bernie Williams goes right back up the middle and Ashby in self-defense knocks it down and is able to get the out at first. Myers coming out into the infield to direct traffic there. Let Ashby know where to throw the ball. Ashby with a runner at second, two out. One run home for the Yankees. Chili Davis. Another one back up the middle. This one's through. O'Neill comes around to score, and it's 2-0 New York in the first.
Get him on, get him over, get him in. And it's 2 nothing Yankees here in the opening inning of game number two. Tried to come inside on Chili Davis, just didn't get it in there far enough. The high bounce in front of home plate enough to get over Andy Ashby into center field. Here's a look from Super Shot. Gomez very close to gloving that ball up the middle. Just enough to get through into center field. Super Shot, a look we're trying to give you. A little closer look, a slower replay, and you could see it was just out of the reach of Gomez as Tino Martinez digs in and takes a strike. One home run, a grand slam here last night in game one. He's driven in five in this entire postseason. He has struggled in his career in the postseason as a Yankee. If Knobloch wasn't ready to talk about redemption, Tino Martinez, after taking this 2-2 pitch just low, did this. The grand slam to make it a 9-5 Yankee lead in a seven-run seventh inning. And Tino Martinez is more than willing to admit the relief he felt after pounding that pitch out of this ballpark. And a lot of times when you've been struggling at the plate, all it takes is one line drive or one ball hit right on the button to get that feeling back. The 1-1. One, one. Now Martinez set up at a ball and two strikes. This is the old killing them softly inning. A leadoff walk, a stolen base. Ball back to the pitcher, an error by Caminiti, which allowed the first run to score. A ball back to the pitcher. A ball back to the pitcher off the bat of Chili Davis. It went over his head and into center, and it's 2-0 New York. Now the one two to Martinez two and two two hit and run plays in this inning the keys even though one was a stolen base with Knobloch running and Jeter swinging and missing and then the hit and run with Bernie Williams dropped by Ashby but that moved Paul O'Neill over the Bombers not living up to their name tonight <laughs> still two and two on Tino Martinez. We ought to just call them the bottom liners because that's all that matters. Find a way to get those runners around the bases and onto home plate and back in the dugout. And the Yankees have done that better than anybody this year. The Bronx Tricklers. <laughs> <laughs> two balls, two strikes on Tino Martinez. Down the right field line. Fair ball. Chili Davis limping around second and into third, not running well. And it's a long, loud single for Tino Martinez to set up first and third, 2 out. And a terrific play by Tony Gwynn in right field to hold Martinez to a single and Davis to third base. It's a dangerous right field to play. That ball can rattle around out there. This ball looked like it hit right on the line. Similar to Ricky Lede's double last night. Fine play by Gwynn. And Gwynn made a nice play on Lede's double last night. He was out here early during batting practice, had one of the coaches hitting him some fungos down into that right field corner so he could get used to playing those angles. Goes right to the spot where the ball comes and hustles it back into the infield quickly. Boy, Tino Martinez smoked that ball. Talk about feel. Ooh. That was the feel you were talking about, Bob. Another good swing by Tino Martinez if he's back. This Yankee lineup will have a much different look. Here's a team New York that hit only 218 during the American League Championship Series yet advanced because of pitching and defense. There's one guy who hasn't struggled in the postseason. In the Yankee pinstripe, Scott Brocious, first and third, two out, two nothing, New York, first inning. And a strike over the inside corner. Already a visit here in the first inning from Dave Stewart. Brocious a base hit. It's three nothing Yankees. 
Scott Frost just knocks in his 10th run of this postseason. The Yankees scored 12 runs in the first inning in the American League Championship Series against Cleveland. Three here tonight for El Duque. They have given him the best run support in the major league, scoring almost seven runs a game and off to a hot start again tonight. And I think it bears repeating. We mentioned it last night. 32 times during the regular season, the Yankees scored five or more runs in an inning. It's just like a snowball rolling downhill. They start throwing those base hits in there. They mix in a walk. They constantly keep the pressure on that opposing pitcher. Now first and second, two out. As Posada takes a ball low and away. You can see the smile on the face of Chili Davis smiling over on the bench after having to go first to third. He tore ligaments in his right ankle, isn't running well, and was able to basically walk home on the single by Ambrosius. 1 0 to Posada. One ball, one strike. Think back to how this inning opened with Knobloch drawing the walk. And remember the foul ball that Myers got to, had it in his glove and couldn't hang on. Knobloch battled for the walk. Important error by Caminiti. And a 3 0 Yankee lead with a chance for more. Strike two, and Myers was crossed up. A ball and two strikes on Posada. You can tell by the way a catcher reacts. That pitch does something different than he was anticipating. Started to move the glove up and away, had to come back down to the middle of the zone to catch the pitch. Not only is that dangerous for a wild pitcher, a pass ball, but you take a lot of strikes away from your pitcher. Right. Back to boxing balls like that when they do something you're not anticipating. It looked like Greg was looking for a tailing fastball and got a slider. Now the one two pitch to Posada. Still one and two as Brian Bowringer, the ex Yankee, cranks it up to the Padres out in their bullpen here in the first. Travel day tomorrow in this series. And then game three will come your way on Tuesday evening. Ashby a long first inning. The one two to Posada. Right at the second baseman Veras drops it. Throws to first. That was an ugly play as he nearly picked off Joyner at first. The Yankees come up with three. A big error mixed in and after one inning in game two three nothing New York. Most enduring corporate images, the Goodyear blimp is floating overhead, providing aerial pictures for tonight's game. The Spirit of Akron is proud to be a part of the 100th anniversary celebration of the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. And we're glad they're with us tonight. Beautiful night, warm for this time of year here in New York. And down below, a good first inning for the Yankees as they come up with three unearned runs. Silvio Veras goes up the ladder, thought he had that ball in the air, popped out of the glove, almost threw it away at first. He said it a very ugly play to end the bottom of the first inning. But it worked to end a 29 pitch first inning for Andy Ashby to go along with what you talked about Bob in the opening. 29 pitch first inning a long inning for Ashby as the Padres try to avoid that middle relief rut. They fell into in game one. Finley at the plate. And Hernandez has missed with each of the first three. It's 3 0. Vanderwall next, and then Greg Myers. 3 1. Mel Stottlemyre, the pitching coach for Joe Torrey. And the rookie, Orlando Hernandez. Full count. In the last 50 years, only six rookies have started Yankee games in the World Series. Mel Stalmar was one. Orlando Hernandez, of course, another. Whitey Ford was the first one back in 1950. Finley strikes out as he chased one on three and two.
Nice comeback by El Duque here after falling behind 3 and 0. Comes back with three consecutive fastballs to get the swinging strike on Steve Finley. Which is down low out of the strike zone. And now the first pitch to Vanderwall is up for ball one. Finley had that disgusted look on his face about the split second he let the bat go. Going after that low pitch on three and two. He's the first out. And now Hernandez behind on the count again. It's two and zero oh on Vanderwall. Two and one. What an eventful LCS John Vanderwall had. The big throw to get Walt Weiss to Jim Laritz in game three. And then the two run homer that put the Padres in front in game five. Only to see Atlanta coming back to win it. Two and two now on Vanderwall. You want the throw, you get the throw. Vanderwall gunning down Walt Weiss in what could have been a two run inning or more. Layrich hanging on on the other end. We've already shown you catcher cam once tonight. It bit the dust right there. Vanderwall into left center field. That falls in for a one out hit. By the way, after Vanderwall made that play, the Padres would eventually come from behind and win game three behind Sterling Hitchcock, who was the MVP of that series against Atlanta. Now Greg Myers, who has had just a couple of postseason at bats, he's gone deep in one of them in game five. Off the Atlanta bullpen to make it a one run game. That was the game that ended seven to six. He came off the bench and belted a home run. And here he is with his first at bat with Vanderwall at first and one out. Ball one. This inning, uh, seen some stiff swings by the Padres. One by Vanderwall, a little flare to left center. And that 3 2 pitch by Steve Finley. Normally that uh, tells you that a team is a bit tight and the Padres appear that way tonight. Fastball for a strike one and one and Caminiti with a similar swing in the first inning when he yeah. struck out on a fastball down and in which mm -hmm. is his power zone took a very stiff awkward swing at that pitch. Hernandez with a one ball one strike count on Myers. Now strike two. And that may get back to the bullet point we had on the scouting report on El Duque. He hides the ball so well. You don't see the pitch until it's about halfway to home plate. You recognize it as a fastball in the strike zone, but by then it's too late to pull the trigger and you end up taking awkward swings. Fires the pop up behind second. Bernie Williams on to make the catch two down. Kevin Towers, the senior vice president, general manager of the San Diego Padres. Many would vote for Jerry Hunsaker of the Houston Astros in the executive of the year category. Even get some votes around here for Brian Cashman and the job that he has done. Not panicking and making the trade for Randy Johnson, sticking with what he had. But a guy who also deserves consideration is Kevin Towers for the work he has done. Helping to build this Padre team. One on, two out. Gomez, ball one. And a lot of incremental improvements in the Padres ball club. The addition of Greg Myers, a left handed hitting catcher. The addition of John Vanderwall, a very solid pinch hitter from the left side of the plate. We got Vanderwall on the last day of August, a month after the trading deadline. Vanderwall had cleared waivers, and it's one of those for a player to be named later deals. One ball, one strike on Chris Gomez. Strike two as Hernandez tries to get around a one out single by Vanderwall. I think it's interesting. You look at this Padres team, they only have two homegrown players Joey Hamilton and Tony Gwynn, guys that were drafted by the organization, came up through the organization. There are more players who are homegrown Yankees on the Padres roster. Then there are Padres homegrown. Twice as many. Four. <laughs> A ball and two strikes on Gomez. Wouldn't chase it. Two and two. 
Of course, Brian Bowringer, Sterling Hitchcock, Jim Lairitz, and Ruben Rivera all came up through the Yankee system before moving on to the San Diego Padres. A couple of them there, Lairitz and Rivera. The 2-2 two -two to Gomez. Full count. That'll give Vanderwall a head start over at first. Chris Gomez, the number nine hitter for San Diego. Last night was one for three. Runner goes, 3 2 pitch, hit the brochures. So solid over there in the postseason. Martinez digs it out on the other end, and Hernandez around a one out single by Vanderwall. Bottom of the second in game two. Yankees bat up three. Bottom of the second, 3 0 New York. Number nine hitter Ricky Lede, who didn't act like a number nine hitter here last night, leads it off against Ashby and strike one. Last night, Ricky Lede, the rookie, hit a two run double in the second inning with the bases loaded and two out, with the Yankees out in front. Later had a single after that, a walk and a run scored in the seven run seventh. Leading off here in the second. He has a 1 1 count. Here's the double against Kevin Brown. And the second inning just fair down the line, and it gave the Yankees a 2 0 lead. Outside, two balls and a strike on Lede. He learned after the fact that last night Kevin Brown was suffering from flu like symptoms. 2 and 2, which he evidently suffered from in last year's. World Series when he went 0 2 for Florida against the Cleveland Indians. And also, apparently, the ball that was hit back through the box by Chili Davis and off of his shin apparently did more damage than we initially thought. Lede, another hit through the right side, and that's how he starts the bottom of the second. At play that ended the top of the second inning, this is a super shot, literally. Watch Scott Brosis get the ball in throwing position. All fielders try to get the ball, outfielders or infielders, into that position across the seams. That right there is a four seam fastball. That's how pitchers throw four seam fastballs. It's straight, deliberate, even though it veered a little bit to the left. Nice play by Tino Martinez. What a shot that was. So now Lede at first with nobody out as the Yankees put their leadoff man on. Again, Knobloch did that in the first, and here's Knobloch at the plate, strike one. If you talk to infielders that make throwing errors, more often than not, the reason for the throwing error is the fact they couldn't find the seams. Somewhere between fielding the ball in the glove and making the transfer to the throwing hand, getting into throwing position, they're not able to find those seams, and that's usually when the ball flies high and sails away from the first baseman. Nothing in one to count. Not block. Pass Caminiti into left. Lede will hold at second. Good play backing up by Gomez, and it's two on with nobody out. Back to back singles, and Knobloch is on for the second time. We talked about positioning earlier with outfielders. Well, positioning very important for infielders also. Caminetti in, protecting against the bunt. Had he been back, conceivably that could have been a double play ball. He had to protect against the bunt, and for that reason, the angle's bad. Off his glove, and Knobloch with an infield hit. Hit him in the wrist. Actually dove a little too far that time. Mm -hmm. Damn it, he goes to his left as well as any third baseman I've ever seen. Normally, that's a play that he makes. But because he was drawn in out of position, it made it a very tough play. Now it's two on with nobody out for Jeter. The Padres expect the bunt. Ashby trying to get an early look, and Jeter, if he's going to bunt, didn't tip it off as Ashby looked back at the runner Lede at second. Caminetti giving the signs at third base. It's very difficult to work a rotation play in this situation because you don't know whether Jeter's going to bunt or not. Rotation plays when the third and first baseman charge, shortstop to third, second baseman to first. 
Ball one, low and away. You can do it with a pitcher up there that you know is going to bunt. You can't do it with a good hitter like Jeter up there. you got to play it straight up. And that rotation play just opens too many holes in the infield. I mean, you don't even have to try to hit the ball to a hole. There's holes everywhere on a rotation play. No tip off by Jeter there either as Ashby looked back at Lede. Now Jeter put down three sacrifice bunts during the course of the regular season, but with a three nothing lead, maybe Joe Torrey's going to roll the dice and let Jeter go ahead and swing away in this situation, try to drive in a run. Now he's going to bunt, pulls back from ball two, two and oh. Rotation play, first and third baseman charge, shortstop to third, second baseman to first. The idea is to get the throw to third base. And sometimes uh, you complete that third to first double play. Like an electronic chess match. <laughs> Here's the 2 0 runners go, swing and a miss, throw to third. Lede is now out if he wasn't out the first time, and it's a runner at second, one away. So that is the ultra aggressive play. They go from the straight swing to the bunt to the hit and run with two on, nobody out. And Jeter missed the pitch. Outstanding throw by Greg Myers. He threw a bullet to third base. Tough pitch to handle. Caminetti in front of the bag missed the tag initially, but not now. See, Ken Caminetti on tag plays at third base, plays it like a catcher at home plate. He will drop that knee. He felt he was closer to the base when he dropped that knee. At this point, there's no way Ricky Lede is getting back to third base. Now Jeter to the right side under the glove of Varis. Here comes Knobloch. No throw, and it's 4 0 Yankees in the second. Bruce Bochy has to be tempted to pull one of his outfielders and position him right in the middle of the field. The Yankees continue to go back through the mound into center field. You see managers do that in the last inning of a, a close ball game, bring an outfielder in, use five infielders. <laughs> Would have cut down some of the Yankees' hits in this ball game. Now, even though you're kidding. <laughs> You have a situation where really the hardest hit ball was off the bat of Tino Martinez down the right field line. O'Neill pops it into left for Vanderwall. Oh! Two out. At least I think you're kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. O'Neill's now 0 for 2 and in this World Series 0 for 7. Here comes Bernie Williams. Not much in this postseason for Williams. Who is staring free agency squarely in the face at the end of this World Series. The Yankees will have just over two weeks to negotiate with Williams exclusively before he is out on the open market if they can't get anything done. One on, two out. And a strike to Bernie Williams. Constantly asked the questions about free agency and about where he could end up. And while he answers the questions, they're short answers, and then he usually follows that up with, but it's not something that I should be thinking about right now. Runner at first, two out. And a no two count in a hurry on Bernie Williams. Usually with speed on first, a guy like Joe Torrey will give Bernie Williams a chance to hit up to two strikes, but then turn him loose with the count 0 and 2. One of the big reasons for that is a pitcher will try to waste a pitch on the 0 2 or 1 2 count and make it a ball in the dirt to run on. Check on Jeter, who stole 30 bases during the regular season. It's a 4 0 Yankee lead, much to the dismay of Dave Stewart. It's got to be frustrating, frustration on the part of Andy Ashby. Misses outside three unearned runs in the first inning. One run on three singles here in the second.
Pitchers love long waits in the dugout. That means something's happening. <laughs> Hernandez has already had two. Pitch out on one and two. Two balls, two strikes. Two balls, two strikes, one on, two out. That's foul. We had that shot of Dave Stewart. He was very open about the fact that he eventually wants to head to the front office somewhere and become a general manager, but in his first year as pitching coach, he's been surprised at how much fun he's had. Although he doesn't look like he's having too much fun right now. Not right now. He's brought a lot physically to this Padres pitching staff teaching that split finger to some of the guys that didn't have it before and refining the guys that did throw the split but above and beyond that just increasing the intensity of these Padres pitchers Ashby a guy throughout his career that was had a reputation of not trusting his stuff he had such a good arm and such good stuff but wasn't getting the kind of results improved that split finger under Dave Stewart improved his focus on the mound and had an outstanding year. Cheater is running as Williams fouls it away. You can imagine how intense the front office would be if he became a general manager. <laughs> Some nasty looks around the copying machine. It's my paper. It's my pen. Sit down at your desk and focus. Fax it now. So that's his eventual goal. He learned in the San Diego front office and then came down to the field to take over as pitching coach and he watches as Andy Ashby brings it on two and two to Bernie Williams. Jeter stays put ball three high and now Jeter will go. So Andy Ashby who has been very good in this postseason. At least in the NLCS with two strong starts against Atlanta. Not too sharp. Here in the first couple of innings. Well the defense let him down in the first inning. A couple of hitters have battled from 0 and 2 to 3 and 2 and that's the case with Bernie Williams here. Jeter goes and Williams fouls it. It's hard to remember that Derek Jeter is only in his third full year in the big leagues. See him talking to the second base umpire, Dana DeMuth. Had over 200 hits during the regular season. It's better and better defensively at short. He's already one of the best there. And he has handled New York extremely well. He will go on the 3 2 pitch to Bernie Williams. Into right center field. Well hit. At the track, at the wall, goodbye. Two-run homer, Bernie Williams. And it's six to nothing, Yankees in the second. First home run for Bernie Williams in this postseason. Shelly Davis takes a ball low and away and for Andy Ashby. It's the second he's allowed since the curtain came down in the regular season. And on the 50th pitch in an inning and two thirds the Yankees increase their lead. Wow. A 1 0 pitch to Chili Davis. That pitch was right in Bernie Williams' wheelhouse. One of the things you go over in a scouting report is when you have to attack a hitter with a fastball, what location do you want to throw that pitch? Because there are going to be situations where you have to throw a strike with a fastball. 
This pitch is down and in right in Bernie Williams wheelhouse and he gets all of it. And now a ball low to Chili Davis. So last night it was Chuck Knobloch breaking through then Tino Martinez in the same inning and tonight Bernie Williams who came in to that at bat eight out of thirty seven in the postseason. Time seemingly preoccupied gets his first home run a two run shot to make it six nothing. Two and two on Chili Davis. In good company for Bernie Williams most career postseason home runs he gets his first of 1998 and the ninth in his career although with many many more chances compared to those on the list in front of Bernie Williams. Chili Davis strikes out it's the first strikeout for Andy Ashby but three more runs for the Yankees they lead by six back after this from your local Fox station. Melrose places Rob Estes and Kelly Rutherford are enjoying the World Series game two. But tomorrow night they'll jump into action when Fox raises the hemlines for miniskirt Monday. They'll miss it tomorrow night on an all new Melrose place. I think it's one Yankee hat that they're all passing to one another <laughs> to make their World Series debuts. Last night Calista Flockhart. He's here along with many others. Ball one to kill the Varis. Now strike one. One and one on the leadoff hitter. Varis with Gwynn and Vaughn to follow. That's strike two. It is obvious to say for Orlando Hernandez that making a postseason start is not pressure. Pressure is climbing into a makeshift raft leaving your family behind in your home country to battle the seas and try to eventually end up in the big leagues. That's obvious. But in a way it almost degrades the type of pitching and the type of baseball and competition that he was involved in in his homeland in Cuba. I mean you're looking at the top pitcher on the Cuban national team with heavy pressure situations and a guy who won 129 games and lost only 47 as Varis fouls it back two and two. I mean you talk about Cuba guys it's to some the cradle of baseball in the Caribbean and baseball dates back into the 19th century and they don't take those games any more lightly than we all take the World Series as Hernandez has been involved in intense situations on the mound before in his life. But this is not pressure compared to his journey here eventually to Yankee Stadium as he strikes out Kilby Overa's fourth strikeout and the first down here in the third inning in walks Tony Gwynn and here are his thoughts on playing in historic Yankee Stadium. This is history you know this is where you know Babe Ruth played this is where Joe DiMaggio played Lou Gehrig I mean there's been so many great Yankees to play here and when you turn the corner and you see Babe Ruth, Babe Ruth you know Babe is Babe Ruth and so it hit me pretty hard as you start to walk around you see Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra, Thurman Munson and on and on and on it's almost like being at the Hall of Fame place where Tony Gwynn will eventually end up in Cooperstown if he has been in awe it hasn't shown at the plate he's already one for one tonight in the series four out of five Here's the monument for Babe Ruth. Strike two on Tony Gwynn. You get the feeling if George Herman Ruth weren't nicknamed the Babe, they probably would have called him Boomer. <laughs> and vice versa. If David Wells wasn't the Boomer, he would have been Babe. That's right. Babe just got it first. <laughs> One out, nobody on. A ball and two strikes on Gwynn. Two and two. It's neat to hear a guy like Gwynn and his respect for baseball history and we talk about Wells and his respect for baseball history and particularly Babe Ruth in the Yankee tradition as Gwynn pops it into left field for Lede. Two out. So few players young players in any professional sport 
know so little about the history of that <laughs> sport and that's not the case with Gwyn or Wells. San Diego trying to build a tradition. It's going to be a long time before any team builds the tradition that the Yankees have built. The 90th World Series game played here in Yankee Stadium. Team of the century? Well, don't know yet. They've had 23 World Championships. 23rd they owned back in 1996. When you make the comment, Tim, about you don't know yet, you're talking about this version of the Yankees, the 1998 team. Mm -hmm. As Vaughn pops it up down the left field line for Jeter, and the Padres go in order in the third. Bottom of the third inning rolls around. Yankees bat, Martinez, Brocious, Posada coming up. 6 nothing Yanks. Andy Ashby back to work, back to the hill, bottom of the third inning with the bottom part of the order coming up. Six, seven, and eight for the Yankees, starting with Tino Martinez. He starts with ball one. Martinez a single his first time up. His last couple of swings have been awfully good. One ball, one strike. Pitch from Ashby, strike two. Hit a couple of balls well, like Tina Martinez has done in his last two at bats. Get that confidence back. That is a huge difference. That check up from the neck up. Up the middle and through. Tino Martinez is two for two tonight. Three for his last three, dating back to last night's Grand Slam. Well, folks, watch for the Gillette Mach 3 Strike Zone Challenge prior to Game 4 in San Diego, the 1998 World Series, where you will see one lucky fan get the chance to throw a pitch for $2 million. Gillette will donate $1 million to the Susan G. Coleman Breast Cancer Foundation. In addition to the $1 million, Gillette will pay the Strike Zone Challenge winner. That's before Game 4 in San Diego as Brocious lines a base hit into left. In the bottom of the order doing damage for the Yankees. Brocious two for two. This is up around the letters of Scott Brocious. Jumps on the first pitch he sees, lines it into left field. You know, going back to that Tino Martinez at bat, the good signs just keep coming. He's turned on a couple of fastballs, pulled them hard into right field. That base hit up the middle was a changeup down and away from him. He stayed on it, went back up the middle of the field, was not fooled at all. And an awkward situation always for a catcher when he's told by the bench. You could see Dave Stewart telling Greg Myers to go out and talk to him. Here it is right here, trying to get his attention. Look at Dave Stewart on the left of your screen going out to talk to him, and that puts, uh, try to build up the confidence between the pitcher and the catcher, and that doesn't help. Two on with nobody out. Posada to Barris. They get the middleman and turn them both. Four, six, three. And it's a runner at third with two down. A nicely turned double play between Barris and Gomez. Second baseman usually tries to give the shortstop a throw to the outfield side so he can elude the runner better. Nicely done by Barris. Very deliberate throw. Outside part of the bag and turned nicely by Gomez. And the reason Varis could be a little more deliberate on this play, he knew who was running. That Orhe Posada, the catcher running down that first baseline, does not have the best speed on this Yankees roster, so he took his time and made sure to make a good throw. A ball now to Ricky Lede, who's a mere three out of four in World Series play. There's Martinez at third with two out, one ball, one strike as Ashby tries to hang in there. The Yankees leading by six here in the third. A lot of pitches, 63, and he hasn't even finished off three innings. 
only three earned runs of the six scored by the Yankees. Two and one. Missing outside three and one on Lede. Runner at third, two down. Lede down the left field line, another hit. Into the corner. In the score, Martinez. It's an RBI double for Ricky Lede, and it's seven to nothing Yankees. Ricky Lede has had six plate appearances in this World Series, and he has reached base six times. Well, we've seen him turn on fastballs and pull them into right field. This time he goes the opposite way. Right now for the Yankees, seven is the number. It was last night, seven runs in the seventh inning. And they have already knocked out San Diego starter Andy Ashby with seven runs on ten hits. We're in the third. Bowringer enters. Seven runs allowed by Ashby. Three were unearned, but that is of little consequence to Ashby or the Padres. It's seven nothing. The Yankees lead in the third inning. Runner at second, Lede and Knobloch. Strike one. Ryan Bullringer, the new pitcher for the Padres. Bullringer's job is to try to put some zeros on that board, give his offense a chance to try to crawl back into this ballgame. Bullringer worked a third of an inning here last night. He has two strikes on Knobloch here. Still a lot of time left, but the Padres are going up against a pitcher that they have not been able to pick up first time through the order. There's your seven runs. 6.9 per game for the Yankees in support of Orlando Hernandez. They've scored seven. Runner at second, two out. Three consecutive foul balls off the bat of Chuck Knobloch. I guess Padre fans can go back to the 1996 World Series when the Atlanta Braves beat the New York Yankees in the first two games here at Yankee Stadium, 12 to one and four to nothing, and then went down to Atlanta and won three in a row. Did the Yankees and clinched it back here in Game Six? The 0-2 ball and two strikes to Knobloch. Talk to Joe Torre about the atmosphere back in San Diego. These Yankee players sure have seen on TV but aren't fully aware of the kind of atmosphere they're going to be surrounded with on Tuesday night. Another foul from Knobloch. As electric an atmosphere as we have seen here at Yankee Stadium or at Jacobs Field in Cleveland. Electricity in the twilight. Those games will be starting at 5 o'clock out there. Tough to see. Runner at second, Lede, two out, a ball and two strikes on Nabla. Outside corner and Bullringer rings up Chuck Nabla. He closes out the third, and as we go to the fourth inning, Ashby is finished. The Yankees lead by seven. And Caminetti leads off in the fourth inning. It's seven to nothing Yankees. Seven runs on ten hits for New York. No runs on two hits for the Padres. Caminetti struck out his first time up. We intend to detail that strikeout. As Caminetti takes low, it's two and zero. Oh. Joyner will follow, and then Finley is the Padres trying to. Crawl back into this game right now. Shut out on only two hits. The first baseman Martinez one down. 
Well, the book on Ken Caminiti in the National League is pitch him away early in the count, jam him inside late in the count. Let's watch what Hernandez does here on the pitch placement chart. First pitch is a breaking ball on the outside corner. Comes back with a sinking fastball on the outside corner, and then in the 0-2 count, a four-seam fastball down low and inside, and the very stiff, awkward swing by Caminiti. Obviously locked up with that fastball inside. Caminiti now 0 for 2 after lining out to first. To start the fourth. Joiner takes ball one low. Wally Joiner flying to right, deep to right. His first time up. Go back to that defensive play by O'Neill. Up against the wall. Didn't pull a home run back, but an extra base hit. He took away, and now Joyner to the right side. Robbed again. Shutting up block with a dive to his left. Our Aflac trivia question here in the fourth inning. The Padres and Yankees have combined for five home runs. They did that last night. What is the record for most home runs combined in a World Series game? Last night it was five. Two out, nobody on as Finley rips it foul. First, Paul O'Neill robbing Wally Joyner, and now Chuck Knobloch held on to the ball when he hit the ground and made the throw. Nice play. That's not always an easy play for a second baseman. They use such a small glove. There's very little pocket there. Many times when they hit the ground, that ball will trickle out of the glove, but that time Knobloch able to hold on. To the right side again, Tino Martinez to El Duque for the out. Score at 3-1. That's eight in a row retired by the rookie right-hander. Yankees lead by seven, bottom of the fourth. Bottom of the fourth inning as we check out Scott Wolf. Stars in Fox's Wednesday night drama Party of Five. He co-stars with two young actresses. They're in movies today, Nev Campbell and Jennifer Love Hewitt. Party of Five returns Wednesday, October 28th, right here on Fox. Starting to realize that it's a good thing that Fox has a couple of animated hits or none of us would get tickets. <laughs> Jeter first up here in the fourth inning, seven to nothing Yankees. What do you think, Bobby? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Uh -oh. <laughs> Strike two over the outside corner to Jeter. No, if Hank Hill was here, he'd be sitting right up here next to us with a propane heater going. <laughs> O'Neill and Williams will follow here in the fourth inning. Yankees lead, seven runs on ten hits. O'Ringer closed out the third inning by striking out Knobloch. Has a one two count on Jeter. Up the middle, off the glove of Gomez and into center. Jeter's two out of three as he starts the fourth inning with a single. Our Aflac trivia question the Padres and Yankees combined for five home runs last night. It's the record for the most home runs combined in a World Series game. Game seven of the 1960 World Series. That's my guess. 1989 series. I was there in uniform. Oh, wasn't on the going. active roster, but I was on the bench for the Giants when Oakland pounded five home runs. The Giants hit two. And that's our Affleck trivia answer. Seven home runs total. Game three of the 1989 World Series. A series Oakland won four games to none. That was the earthquake series. Last night, the ninth anniversary of that horrible happening in San Francisco. And game three resumed after a 10 day hiatus called by then Commissioner Faye Vincent. That is a change up grip right there. And a change up. To O'Neill is called for a strike one and one. Normally you don't see a guy go behind his back with the same grip that he's going to have in the glove. The reason for that is uh, he is facing the first base coach right now. And if you get in the habit of doing that, then they pick your pitches up very easily. And again, he showed the grip, throws a change up, it's two and one. 
most pitchers that that need to get to an unusual grip like that change up or a split finger fastball it's much easier to go ahead get that change up grip on the ball and change to a normal fastball grip than it is to do the other way have a fastball grip and change to the change up you see a lot of guys that throw a split finger will get the split finger grip on the ball as they take their sign go into their set position and if they change they go from that. Jose Cardinal on your left, the first base coach for the Yankees, and the grip on your right, Ryan Bowringer. Three balls and a strike on O'Neill. Full count, three and two. Our center field camera so many times has picked up Greg Maddox, who is a master at changing those fingers around. The index finger, the middle finger, and the ring finger. You can almost see his fingers doing his thinking for him. Three and two on O'Neill. Jeter is running and O'Neill chops to short. Padres will only get one out at first by starting the runner. The Yankees avoid the double play and it's Jeter at second with one out. That'll bring in Bernie Williams who went deep. His first 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 postseason home run in this. Action for the Yankees as he took one low and rode it over the wall in right center field. And gets his first of 1998. One out of two tonight. A strike to Williams. You can see he didn't change the grip no. on that pitch in the glove, and it was a changeup. There are different ways to throw the change up. Some pitchers use the circle change where the index finger and the thumb come together. They throw it with their last three fingers, not bowling. Very important to have the same arm motion with that change up. That's really what it is. It's a change in the grip, not a change in the delivery. You have the same arm motion as the fastball, and the ball doesn't do the same thing, simply said. If you find a pitcher throwing a changeup and slowing down his motion, those are the balls that get hit a long way. That's the easiest thing for a veteran hitter to pick off, up off a rookie pitcher or a young pitcher. They think by speeding up the body, it's going to fool you. It doesn't. 0-2 oh on Williams, 1-2. and Bowringer starting with that changeup grip behind his back. And then here's the arm motion. Everything the same as a regular fastball. But with that grip, there's no way you can throw it with the same velocity as your fastball. Runner at second is Jeter. One out, a ball and two strikes on Bernie Williams. Into center field for Finley. To his right, two out. So a leadoff hit, then O'Neill grounded out. Williams flied out. Shirley Davis will get a shot at driving in a run. He did so back in the first inning, later scored a run, and he struck out since then. Ashby still watching from. San Diego dugout as Bowringer brings it to Chili Davis. A strike over the inside corner. Joe Buck, Bob Brenly, Tim McCarver with you. 9.30 on the scoreboard clock here at Yankee Stadium. Padres threatened in the first inning, didn't get anything. The Yankees got three unearned runs in the first, three more in the second, one in the third. Knocked out Andy Ashby, the starter for San Diego, in that third inning. Now the 0 1 from Bowringer. Strike two on Chili Davis. Generally, when teams get Chili Davis in a two strike hold, they go up the ladder with that four seam fastball above the belt, try to get him to chase a pitch up high out of the strike zone. Chili is widely recognized as an outstanding low ball hitter from the left side of the plate.
Myers and Bullring are having trouble getting together on a sign. And it always takes a little longer with the runner at second base. As a catcher, you have to go through a series of signs so that runner at second doesn't relay to the hitter what pitch you're going to throw. Here's the 0-2. Ball and two strikes. The San Diego Padres last night fell behind early, battled back, had a three-run lead as late as the seventh inning. And then a seven-run seventh inning was stunning for the Padres. Electrifying for the Yankees. And here they are with seven runs already in game two. Two balls, two strikes on Chili Davis. Thing about the Padres coming into last night's game, they had won five of six games in the playoffs on the road. The only game they lost was that game in Houston, five to four on the Bill Spires hit. That was game two of the division series. Here's the 2 2 to Davis. We'll do it again. And then you've got the Yankees who took care of the Texas Rangers dominating pitching. Went through Texas three and out. Allowing only one run along the way. And at one point trailed two games to one in the ALCS against the Indians with Tonight's pitcher Hernandez on the mound battled back 2 2 and then won the next two. One in Cleveland, one here at Yankee Stadium to move to the World Series. The 2 2 to Davis, 3 and 2. David Wells, the MVP of that American League Championship Series. But no bigger start than the one made by Orlando Hernandez, and because he was so effective. It bought him game two of the World Series and maybe game six. If this series goes that long. Instead of Andy Pettit. As Davis takes strike three, he thought he had drawn a walk. That's the final out here in the fourth inning. Second strikeout for Bullringer, and the Yankees do not score. Seven nothing, New York. It off down below, up above. Over the past 70 years, millions have watched the Goodyear blimps hovering over special events. Goodyear's fleet of six blimps now extend over Europe and South America. Celebration of the tire and rubber company's 100th anniversary. Pilot tonight, Pat Henry, is at the controls. Vanderwall takes a ball from El Duque to start the fifth inning. Hernandez has retired eight in a row. Vanderwall has the last hit for the Padres. Strike one. We mentioned throughout this series that John Vanderwall, throughout his career, has been known as a pinch hitter deluxe. Just to give you an idea, in his best season offensively with the Colorado Rockies back in 1995, he hit 347. He was in 105 ball games at 101 at bats. <laughs> that was the year he had 28 pinch hits, the most ever by a major league player in one season. Struck him out. That's number five for Hernandez. Joe Torre saying that it is not the stuff of Hernandez, but the command. Watch where this pitch is. Right on the outside part, right in the mid of Posada, freezing Vanderwall. Strike to Myers. Orlando Hernandez has such control that in his first postseason start in Cleveland in game four, Joe Torre said it took him about an inning, maybe a little over an inning, to figure out where exactly the strike zone was. He works from the outside into the strike zone to catch the limit of the strike zone so he knows how far he can go over the outside corner and still get a strike. Strike two on Myers. Really, which is the opposite of what most pitchers do. They start in the strike zone and will try to lead the hitters outside off of the corner until the umpire draws that line in the dirt and said that's far enough. Good change get, up there. Get ahead with strikes, get them out with balls. That's usually how pitchers approach hitters. And has missed the corner there. It's two and two.
Now three and two. Myers the number eight hitter with Gomez on deck. Back to back strikeout six on the night. Joe Torre the manager of the Yankees guided the team to a world championship in 1996. Here are his thoughts on the differences between then and now. It's a little little more relaxing uh, even though when you get in that dugout the you know that mouse is going to run around that wheel in your stomach all the time. But Daryl Strawberry I mean he's our inspiration this year. Uh, we miss him. Uh, we miss having him here. He's out of the hospital. We're pleased about that. Uh, the prognosis is wonderful, and, and the players love talking to him and, and feeling his presence. Gomez lines a base hit into right center field. Takes a bounce, kicks into the alley, and now Bernie Williams kicks it to the wall as Gomez will dig for third and make it with two out. That breaks the string of ten in a row retired by El Duque. And we'll see how they score it. Either a double and an error or a straight triple for Chris Gomez. Looked like a mix up between Paul O'Neill and Bernie Williams. This ball slicing away from Williams. He tries to slide and make the catch. Off the heel of the glove. And that allows Chris Gomez to go to third base. So a triple for Chris Gomez. Real good look from the super shot. Bernie Williams had the glove down there in position. The ball just hit the heel, bounced away, allowing Gomez to advance to third base. It is a triple, no error, and now a strike to kill the Overis, who will try to put San Diego on the scoreboard. Overis has driven in two runs in this postseason. One out of six in the World Series. Ball one strike when you're trailing by seven runs in the middle innings normally it's easier to hit because most of the pitches you get are predictable because the pitcher doesn't want to walk you it's different with Hernandez two balls and a strike he's pitching the same game as if the score were nothing nothing here and if anything he's adding more pitches he's yeah. doing more straight changeups yeah. now that he did the first time through the order really mixing it up well there is a broken bat Base hit down the right field line. In to score is Gomez. Ferris ends up at second with an RBI double at 7 1 New York here in the fifth inning. Ferris gets jammed with this pitch, hits it right off the fist, just over Tino Martinez. The ball hits the tarp. Takes a carom directly to Paul O'Neill. I think O'Neill was caught by surprise that Varis was going for two. Varis, one of the few guys on this Padres roster with good enough speed to try something like this. Trading a bat for a hit. She'll do that any day. And I think you're right. I think O'Neill realizing that the Padres were trailing by six, not going to take chances. But Varis did with two outs. And a big play with Gwynn coming up, but now the comebacker to Hernandez makes the play off the mound, and Gwynn is one for three. The Padres get their first run of game two. They lead their fourth, and after four and a half, seven to one, New York. Back here in the Bronx, Tino Martinez. First pitch swinging against Bullringer, fouls it away, strike one. Bottom of the fifth inning, and the Yankees lead it seven to one. Martinez already two for two tonight, three for his last three. The grand slam in the seventh inning last night. One ball, one strike. You can bet that Chris Shambliss, the hitting instructor, likes what he sees. The last few swings from Tino Martinez, and he'll be dialed in watching Martinez in his third at bat tonight. Two balls and a strike. I'd be smiling too if I was a hitting coach of this Yankees team. <laughs> they hit 288 as a team during the regular season, hit 207 home runs. Martinez pops it up. Caminiti. One away. Martinez retired for the first time tonight. We look at our game summary. Brought to you by MCI. Ken Caminiti, a big error in the first inning. Three unearned runs. 
Derek Jeter an RBI single in the second tonight he's two out of three Bernie Williams his first home run of this postseason a two run shot in the second Ricky Lede two for two tonight he's been all over the bases in the first two games and Kilvio Veras has the only San Diego RBI Scott Brocious now O ringer has quietly done a good job entering in the third inning striking out Knobloch getting around a leadoff hit in the fourth inning and he got the leadoff man Martinez here in the fifth to the left side and through past Caminiti and Brocious is three for three Kind of surprised to see Bowringer come back inside with a fastball when he's behind in the count. Greg Myers initially had called for a slider away, then a fastball away. Bowringer shook both of those off to get to a fastball inside. Get a look from Super Shot at the effort by Ken Caminiti. Just misses the glove. You're right, Joe. Ken Caminiti, that big error in the first inning, the three unearned runs, but infielders in particular are more inclined to make an error when a team is running against them. And Joe Torrey allowing his runners two hit and run plays. You, you get that feeling of urgency instead of a, a relaxed feeling if you're an infielder when teams are running all over the place. The 0 one to Posada just missed him. One ball one strike the six seven eight and nine hitters for the Yankees in game two are a combined seven out of ten. Posada the number eight hitter is 0 for 2 as he just got out of the way. One ball one strike Posada fouls it away for strike two. Yankees have an odd platooning situation behind the plate. Posada's the number one catcher. Joe Girardi will catch David Cohn in all probability on Tuesday. But Posada's best side is his right side. He had 357 as a right handed batter. Of course, Girardi's a right handed hitter. So the Yankees, you try to look for dents in their armor, you can't find many. Posada into deep right center field. Track wall, another home run, and it's 9 to 1 New York. hitter from the left side this year that's where his power is and he just showed it fastball out over the plate he unloaded on one ideal situation for the Yankees you know, look at that pitch out over the plate and down a veteran catcher like Joe Girardi that handles pitchers so well He's been around the game for so many years the youngster Jorge Posada coming up obviously the catcher not only of this year but the future for the Yankees very good working relationship between those two men Yankees have hit four home runs in 13 and a third inning so far. Two last night in the seventh. They have two tonight. One by Bernie Williams in the second, and here in the fifth inning. The two run shot by Posada, who has his first hit. Strike two on Lede, who, as I mentioned earlier, has reached base in six consecutive plate appearances. Tonight, two for two. Count on Lede. Nine runs last night, nine runs tonight.
They're in a rut. <laughs> Boring, huh? Yeah. Well, the Yankees have now equaled in their last three games their run production in the first eight games of this postseason. Adding average way up. Average with runners in scoring position way up. Ladane draws a walk, and that is seven plate appearances, seven consecutive trips at least down to first for Ricky Ledet. Last night was two for two, plus a walk, plus he reached on an error. And tonight a single, double, an RBI, and now a walk. Sterling Hitchcock charting the pitches in this ball game. He will be game three starter back in San Diego on Tuesday evening. One on, one out. Ball one to Nabla. And the reason pitching coaches have the next day starting pitcher do that, you get an idea of what pitches are being hit in what counts, what locations to try to give you a better idea going into your start against the same team. Two and zero on Nabla. Chuck trying to reach base for the third time tonight. Now block got the action started back in the first with a leadoff walk after falling behind 0-2. Worked an eight pitch at bat for a walk, stole a base, scored on the error by Caminetti. Question has been raised many times this season about whether this Yankee team is the best or one of the best teams ever assembled, winning 114 games during the regular season. You hear time and time again teams compared to the 27 Yankees. Well, they're not the 27 Yankees. 27 Yankees won 110 games and went on to a world championship. Sweeping Pittsburgh four games to none. This 1998 Yankee team. As Knobloch grounds a base hit through the right side. The hits just keep on coming. Lede will stop at second. For a while there, I'm sure this Yankee club wondered if they would be remembered like the 27 Yankees are remembered or if they'd be remembered at all. People feeling they need the world championship to crown this historic season. They lead one game to none, and here in game two, lead nine to one. Well, I think one question has been asked. They're certainly one of the best teams in the history of the game. That question is, is a no-brainer. That they debate, might be the best. Yeah, and that debate will rage on. As the debates usually do in the game of baseball. Donnie Wall, who was tanked here last night, is into game two in the fifth. Comes in with two on, one out. An ERA of nine in this postseason. One save. Save game one of the NLCS against Atlanta. Derek Jeter. Jeter two hits tonight, an RBI, a run scored. Three hits in this World Series. One ball, one strike. Snake is being a little more aggressive this time through the lineup with the big lead, swinging at some first pitches, going to the plate, looking for that first pitch fastball, and. Really letting it go. I don't know when they're more dangerous, when they're patient or when they're aggressive. Two and one. Would you call them, Tim, patiently aggressive? Yeah. They're aggressive in the strike zone and patient just outside of the zone. You rarely see them swing at many bad pitches. Two on, one out. Two and two. Great situational hitters try to get ahead in the count. 
Usually when they do, they don't foul him back. They hit it hard somewhere. Under the tutelage of Chris Chambliss, a terrific hitter in his own right. That famous home run against Mark Littell in the 1976 American League Championship Series. Barely got around the bases. Two balls, two strikes, two on, one out. A good pitch from Wall, the strikeout. Jeter is retired for the second time tonight. Two on, two out now with two runs home for Paul O'Neill. The new Sunday Night Fox comedy, that 70s show, returns next Sunday if there's no World Series Game 7. Two of its stars, Danny Masterson, Laura Prepon are here tonight. See them throw the party of the year on that 70s show. An all new episode next Sunday night if there is no baseball. Two on, two out for Paul O'Neill. 0 for 3 with a run scored and 0 for 8 in the World Series so far. Only Yankee regular to be held hitless, Paul O'Neill. Wouldn't have thought that yesterday before game time. Kilby Overis charging. Donnie Wall gets out of trouble tonight in game two. As the Yankees come up with two, lead two, have stranded six, and lead by eight after five. For the sixth inning, it's nine to one. The Yankees leading, and we came in last night talking about a couple of question marks in the Yankee offense. They didn't hit much in the ALCS. It only 218, but they exploded in the seventh inning last night, and they've done it here in Game Two. They found the formula, uh, whatever it takes. I tell you, whether it's Chris Chambliss or just uh, uh, the experience of having such a successful 98 season, it's carried right over into the postseason, at least in the last two ball games. Now, Greg Vaughn. The number three hitter in the DH is 0 for 1 with a walk and a pop up. Leads off the sixth inning for San Diego. Back behind the plate, not a play. One ball, one strike. The numbers for El Duque 80 pitches. One run on four hits in five innings. Vaughn on one and one. Sidearm from Hernandez, strike two. Saw Jeff Nelson have some success against Vaughn in last night's game, throwing that Laredo slider on the outside corner, and then broke his bat with a hard sidearm sinker inside. Here's to be the book on Greg Vaughn. Throw him a sidearm breaking ball and then jam him with a sidearm fastball. It's Jeff Nelson out of the Yankee bullpen. He worked here last night. Yankee bullpen last night allowed one unearned run. That was it, backing up David Wells. Not much of a swing from Vaughn. He was fooled, and he becomes the seventh strikeout victim for Hernandez. Further indication that they are just not picking up Orlando Hernandez. You can see Vaughn waiting flat-footed with a flat-footed swing. You do not see Greg Vaughn, a guy with 50 home runs this year, swing like that often. Two home runs in last night's game. Just overpowered. As Caminiti is there with strike one. We may see some swings like that from both ball clubs, however, in game three in San yeah. Diego in the twilight. Similar problems. The Padres hitters having trouble picking up the ball because Hernandez hides it so well. Caminiti into left field for Lede. Two up, two down. Travel day tomorrow, and then Tuesday is game three of the World Series as the scene will shift to San Diego. And that wild crowd at Qualcomm Stadium where David Cohen leads the Yankees against NLCS MVP Sterling Hitchcock. And the rest of the Padres, game three of the World Series, beginning Tuesday at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, only on Fox. You have to start asking yourself as you watch Orlando Hernandez, what have we been missing lately from the island of Cuba? Orlando Hernandez is the older half-brother of Levon Hernandez, last year's World Series MVP. 
And as the transportation, the communication has been shut off, these players having to risk death to make it to the major leagues. Here's Orlando Hernandez backing up a strong start in the ALCS from game four with a dominating performance against San Diego here in game two of the World Series and doesn't appear affected by the size of this stage at all. Three balls and a strike. After LeBron Hernandez won two games for the Florida Marlins in last year's World Series. David Cohn against Sterling Hitchcock on Tuesday evening. Joyner takes a strike. It's a full count. Orlando Hernandez, star pitcher for the Cuban national team, a rookie in the major leagues, working in the World Series, and delivering ball four high to Wally Joyner's second walk handed out. A Yankee official told me a story about Levon or about uh, Orlando Hernandez pitching in Tampa the spring training headquarters of the Yankees and he was wild all over the place and the, and the Yankee official asked Joe Cubas who is the agent for Hernandez what was wrong he said he's not used to the cool weather it was 75 that day <laughs> Finley pops it up shallow right now block out to get it inning over these Yankees had to wonder after Arambu failed to meet expectations last year, they wondered about Orlando Hernandez. Don't worry, he can pitch. Folks, this copyrighted telecast is presented by Authority of the Commissioner of Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. The accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without expressed written consent. A dominating performance by Orlando Hernandez and a 9 to 1 Yankee lead as they bat in the bottom of the sixth inning. Bernie Williams takes a strike. He's homered tonight, one for three. Well hit into right on a line and caught by Gwynn. One away. It's the kind of line drive that outfielders usually have trouble with the lights. That ball that never really gets up high enough in the air to get above the lights, but Tony Gwynn able to stay with it. Make the basket catch down around knee level. And hang on. Snow cone at the end. <laughs> Five time Gold Glove Award winner. Sporting News is just coming out with a book of the 100 greatest baseball players of this century and Tony Gwynn is number 49 number three on the list of active players behind number 34 Barry Bonds and number 39 Greg Maddox one ball one strike by the way the book starts with Babe Ruth page one number one Henry Aaron, number two. Number two, Willie Mays. Believe Henry Aaron is number five. And we were talking earlier about the great debate that will rage on about this Yankee team and comparing them to different eras and different teams. You bring out a book like that, you know you're going to get arguments with just about every selection and where they rank. Three balls and a strike on Chili Davis. I would imagine it's a subjective list. Oh, absolutely. Right. You know. There are quite a few Yankees, as you might imagine, throughout the pages of that book. Three balls and a strike. One out, nobody on. Three and two now on Chili Davis. We were talking several innings ago between innings about uh, the retired numbers of the Yankees, and there have been a bevy of them. Only two single digits remain. Number two, Derek Jeter wears it. And number six is worn by Joe Torrey. Look at this. It's a long walk down that <laughs> numbered wall. Well, Joe Torrey has 
typically worn nine in his career at the two number eights Bill Dickey and Yogi Berra Anil DiMaggio Ruth ball four is up to Chili Davis I remember when Joe Torre first came here you mentioned six was open so he took number six he said I've always worn number nine so I'm thinking about going out to make pitching changes walking on my hands <laughs> so it looks like a nine as Tino Martinez steps in after the one out walk to Chili Davis number nine was worn by Roger Maris and what a tribute to the Maris family before the game tonight the entire family on hand to throw out the ceremonial first pitch of the ball game and a standing ovation from the crowd here at Yankee Stadium quite a moment Rogers widow Pat was not here but we understand is doing better last time we checked in for the Maris family was in St. Louis when Mark McGuire hit number 62 and she had been in the hospital with some heart trouble but the Maris family telling you Tim that she's doing much better Kevin telling me that last night as a matter of fact one of the great scenes in sports after McGuire hit the home run a genuine affection toward the Maris family. The Roger Maris Yankee hat with the number nine on it. They were honored here before the game, and as you said, a touching moment. Choke you up. We consider all that their father went through, not just in 1961, but after 1961. As he chased, caught, and surpassed the beloved Babe Ruth here in New York. Two balls, two strikes on Tino Martinez. There's the plaque out in Monument Park. And a look from the Goodyear blimp. Monument Park always kept spotless out there for visitors before the ball game. Can't say the same for those bullpens just past Monument Park. One on one out two balls two strikes three and two on Tino Martinez. I don't think I've ever been in a bullpen that was spotless. That's not an adjective that I attach to bullpens. You could put 27 trash cans in a bullpen and every paper cup will end up on the ground. <laughs> Tino Martinez a line drive base hit in the left field and Tino's now three out of four. A walk and a hit in the inning against Downey Wall. And think about the hits. Ball down the line the right field line a single up the middle and a single to left. Further indication that Tino Martinez is back in postseason play. And it's not as though Tino Martinez had never been successful in postseason play. 95 with Seattle against the Yankees. He hit 409 in the division series with a home run and five RBIs. Here's Brocious. Strike one. But then in his next 129 at bats as a Yankee, he had only five RBIs. Five RBIs in his first 13 at bats with Seattle, then five over his next 129 at bats. Before the Grand Slam last night. Strike two on Brocious. Willie Randolph flipping a ball up into the stands to a young fan there. Don Zimmer told us a great story before the ball game how they were messing around a little bit with Willie Randolph, the coaching staff of the Yankees. Up the middle, Varis. Glove steps, throws, got them both. The inning ending double play scored 4 3. We move to the seventh. Back after this word from your local Fox station. After six innings, it's a nine to one Yankee lead in game two. On Vanderwall, first up, strike one. Great shot of Padre fans saying they scored a run tonight. It is an eight run Yankee lead with Vanderwall, Myers, Gomez, the bottom three in the order, coming up against Orlando Hernandez. Just to finish the point about what have we been missing since the early 60s. The last wave, so to speak, of Cuban players included Jose Cardinal, 
the first base coach for the New York Yankees. A couple of guys who could arguably head to the Hall of Fame. Tony Oliva and Tony Perez, who you could make a strong case for to head to Cooperstown. Such baseball talent on that island and throughout the Caribbean. Orlando Hernandez from Cuba. Two balls, two strikes to Vanderwolf. Orlando is the eighth Cuban-born pitcher in World Series history. Mike Cuellar, great left-hander for the Baltimore Orioles. Of course, LeVon Hernandez, Orlando's half-brother. Camilo Pasquale, Diego Segui, Louis Tiant, El Tiante. The 2-2. Two -two. Vanderwall down the left field line. An extra base hit. Vanderwall has his second of the night. He's two out of three. A single, now a double. So Vanderwall has two hits. And we look at the San Diego box score. Barris has one hit and the only RBI tonight for San Diego. Win a hit in his first at bat. Couple of walks handed out. One to Vaughn, one to Joyner. And Gomez, the number nine hitter with a two out triple and a run scored on the double by Barris. That's it. Right now, Vanderwall at second. The lead off in the seventh inning, and here's Greg Myers. Well, over the course of a season, there will be games when the bottom of the order can carry a team and score enough runs to win a ball game. But generally, you need to get production out of those guys in the middle. And you can see the Padres have not done it in this game tonight. That's the Atlanta Braves. Myers pops it up. Ricky Lede. One out. Myers is 0 for 3. Last night, the Yankees scored nine runs and no hits by Paul O'Neill or Bernie Williams. Most runs ever scored in a World Series game in a World Series game when the three and four hitter went hitless. Look up and down the lineup card. In the dugout. You can see the lines made on the left side of the names on the lineup cards as the manager or whoever is in charge of handling the lineup card tracks where the inning ends. And then consequently, who will come up to start the next inning, which obviously plays into pitching changes and pinch hitters, and what have you. See Brocious with a six and then a line underneath it. He ended the sixth inning just moments ago on the 4 3 double play. One ball, one strike on Gomez. Underwall a leadoff double. Myers flied out. Gomez looking for his first postseason RBI. Sidearm delivery, one and two. ball that just missed outside two balls two strikes you just very rarely get a comfortable at bat against Hernandez the different arm angles the different velocity on the pitches the different movement on the pitches a 2 2 to Gomez not a comfortable swing there. He stays alive, two and two. Bob, you were talking last night about uh, Kevin Brown. It was nasty stuff. And nasty is certainly good when it refers to a pitcher. Another word uh, that refers to a pitcher that hitters have a tough time with is funky. Orlando Hernandez is funky and nasty. We're the 70s show people. <laughs> they still hear the two two pitches fouled back and out of play. You know, right from his delivery through the movement on his pitches. I mean, the windup is very unique. You don't see anybody in baseball 
used a similar high leg kick. No. He actually raises up on his right toe as he kicks that leg up in the air. And then that arm comes through at a variety of different angles. And major league hitters are not used to seeing on a regular basis. Take a look at it live on two and two to Gomez. Tim Flannery got in the way. Foul back and out of play. El Duque also the only Yankee on the field right now with his socks showing his black socks. Every other Yankee with the trousers or well, the bottoms of the trousers down. Bob it kind of <laughs> adds to Hernandez when he's on the mound and he brings that knee up by his ear. Take a look at those long legs and the black socks underneath the white pinstripe pants. It's more of the look for Hernandez. Absolutely more of a distraction if he had those pants all the way down to the shoe tops like the rest of his teammates it wouldn't have quite the same effect. From the side Gomez takes ball three. So look at that delivery not the high leg kick this time you'll see the right foot stays down on the ground this time when he goes to the high leg kick when he brings that left knee up around his head that's when that right foot will rock all the way up onto his toes. Same delivery. A foul to keep it three and two. Barris next. Sterling Hitchcock in the middle. We'll get the ball in game three for San Diego. Three two pitch. Little flare into center. Williams got a late break and it's a base hit as it falls in. First and third with only one out for San Diego here in the seventh. Good battling at bat that time by Chris Gomez able to fight off some of those tougher pitches from Hernandez and even though he gets jammed badly with this pitch Bernie Williams you can see in the top of your picture just freezes momentarily thought the ball was hit harder than it was and comes on late. Interesting reaction there from El Duque upset even with his team up by eight at nine to one. His palms to the sky. So Bernie Williams did not get a break on that ball at all. Oh, one of the quirky things, too, he made a good pitch on Gomez. Gomez just flared one in the center. First and third, one out. Varis. Another flare. This time to left. Lede over to get it. Runners will hold at first and third, two out. You can imagine all of the problems coming into a different culture, living in Cuba for most of his life. Fine throw by Lede, a strong throw, and obviously no chance for Vanderwall to try to score. But I'll tell you one of the more foreign things I would imagine to El Duque here in this country, pitch counts. <laughs> he has no clue about what a pitch count is. Matter of fact, he said some things to that effect. He could throw all day. Forget about it. He is one of the better conditioned athletes in the game today. Yep. Tremendous flexibility, as you might imagine, from that delivery, the high leg kick. It's rumored that he can take that left leg and put it behind his head, stand on one foot. I heard that same rumor and an athletic feat. It's it's a it's a treat to come out here and just watch him warm up before a game. Two balls, no strikes on Tony Gwynn, who's one out of three tonight. Padres down by eight. Tony Gwynn trying to make it a little closer. First and third, two out. And 3 0 the count. There is action, by the way, for the Yankees out in their bullpen. 
this postseason in two games game four of the ALCS game two of the World Series nine hits and 13 and two thirds innings one run three and one on Gwynn. Bochi didn't like that call on 3 and 0. Oh. Now the 3 1 pitch. There's ball four to load him up for San Diego with Greg Vaughn coming up. Mel Stottlemyre jogs out of the Yankee dugout with Stanton and Mendoza getting ready in the Yankee bullpen. He's going to give his young pitcher an opportunity to regroup out there on the mound, refocus on what he has to do right here. If a coach or a manager comes out of that dugout and jogs out to the mound, that's usually just a, an informative meeting, maybe to go over some mechanics or a scouting report or just to give him a little breather out there. Here's your pitch count 113 pitches for Orlando Hernandez. And now with the bases loaded, Hernandez will deal with Greg Vaughn, who had a big night here last night in game one. In the third inning with the Padres trailing 2 0, Greg Vaughn took David Wells into right center field over the wall to tie the game. And then in the fifth inning, after Tony Gwynn hit a two run homer, back to back with Gwynn and Vaughn, this shot well over the wall and left, and it did stay fair. A two homer night last night for Greg Vaughn and the Padres losing cause, losing 9 to 6. Bases loaded for Vaughn. We're in the seventh inning. Nine to one, New York. That's backing out of play, strike one. And against Vaughn, more than any other hitter in the Padres lineup, Hernandez drops down sidearm. Occasionally on the other right handers, he's dropped down low three quarters, but with Vaughn, nearly every pitch has been sidearm. Bases loaded, two down here in the seventh inning. Another three quarter sidearm delivery, one ball, one strike. Just a little above legitimate sidearm, very little above it. Vaughn pops it up. On the infield, who wants it? Jeter, hitting over. A leadoff double, a one-out single, a two-out walk. The Padres leave the bases loaded, nine to one, New York. Well, Derek Jeter catches this high pop-up off the bat of Greg Vaughn. This is our super shot. I don't know what you call the opposite of a snow cone. This one almost came out of the bottom of the glove. Catches it on the heel, but he's got the bare hand right there to trap it in the glove. You've had ice cream drop out of the bottom of a cone. That's <laughs> what that was. <laughs> As you see Posada dig in. Explain the name Super Shot. A little different look, as I mentioned earlier. Camera dedicated to catching plays such as that. Close-up shot, slow motion replay, and Production staff at Fox dedicated that camera shot and those replays to the legendary Harry Coyle. He was so responsible for innovations in the way baseball has been televised. Basically a one camera look to multiple cameras, close ups, what have you, and that is in his honor. Two balls and a strike. Posada, two and two. Three and two on Jorge Posada, who hit a two run home run his last time up. That's low for ball four and a leadoff walk. Second walk issued by Donnie Wall. We look at the 
Yankees box score. Tough to keep track of it all, but here it is. Now block two out of three. Jeter a couple of hits. Everybody scored a run up and down the lineup with the exception of the number nine hitter Ricky Lede, who's been involved heavily with two singles and a walk. Actually a single, a double for an RBI and a walk. Rocious three hits and Tino Martinez. After hitting the grand slam in game one as a three for four night working. Here's Lede. Ball from Donnie Wall. Joe Torre reiterating before the game tonight what he has said so often about this Yankee team regardless of the score one way or the other lopsided or not it, none of the guys in that nine man lineup give up an at bat and another indication tonight that that is so true into right field rather well hit but Quinn back to get it one out stop the presses Lede made an out <laughs> the first time in eight Played appearances in the World Series that Lede has not reached base. Well, at least they have a book on him now. Throw him a fastball and let him hit a line drive to the warning track in right. right. That's how you get him out. That's right. <laughs> to go back to the point that you made, Tim, Bob, we talked to Joe Torre earlier in the season. People wondered if the Yankees, who were just running away with the American League East, would continue to stay motivated and if it was a danger not being tested during the regular season really throughout the regular season when you think about it severely tested and Joe Torre said I have a group of guys that you don't have to worry about guys like O'Neill and Williams and Martinez everybody motivated for different reasons but all motivated nonetheless well, generally the younger players look to leadership from the older players and guys like Paul O'Neill and Tino Martinez Scott Brocious, those guys are going to grind on a daily basis. You can count on it. And when the younger players see the way the veterans go about their business, they emulate that and it just flows right down through the entire roster. Young Shane Spencer, Ricky Lede. What a perfect atmosphere for Derek Jeter to grow up in in the big leagues. He and the Yankees have reaped the benefits. Homer Bush. Two and one. Got a shot of Homer Bush right there. We've documented the Yankees starting lineup. What a great season they've had offensively. Even a guy like Homer Bush in limited playing time, 71 at bats on the season, he hit 380. When you get that kind of production from your part time players, you know you're having a special season. Three balls and a strike. Ford to carry Homer Bush because of his speed. Coming over from the San Diego organization. Full count now on Knobloch. From Knobloch to Brian Cashman, who eventually will have to sit down and hammer out something new with Chuck Knobloch, who was traded in the middle of a long term contract and can declare himself a free agent if something isn't worked out. There were reports earlier that something had been done, and if that's the case, it at least hasn't been announced. Three balls, two strikes. Brian Cashman has handled himself so well this year and under the intense pressure. Didn't feel the pressure enough to pull the trigger on any deal for Randy Johnson, and that has paid off in this postseason, and you would have to believe in years to come by not emptying out more of the young prospects to get potential free agent Randy Johnson a walk to not block Brian Cashman the general manager of the Yankees 31 years old younger than so many of the players on the yeah. active roster right. of the yeah. New York Yankees right the winners laugh and tell jokes that's what Brian's doing right now. Now Dave Stewart out to talk. Kevin Towers, we've already documented the job that he has done. A great job in San Diego. By the way, Brian Cashman only wanted a one-year deal himself. So let me see how it goes. Let me see how it works. See how I do. And here the Yankees are 
in the World Series, up one game to none and leading nine to one in game two. So Brian Cashman's a free agent too? In a way. In a way. It has to be an unusual situation when a veteran player goes in to negotiate a contract and Brian Cashman says, geez, I used to watch you play when I was a kid. I, I, have, your, I have your baseball cards. Yeah. <laughs> Two on, one out. For the number two hitter in the Yankee order, Derek Jeter. It's down the line, but slicing foul. Don't forget, Tuesday after a travel day tomorrow, game three of the World Series as we all head to San Diego. David Cohn against Sterling Hitchcock, the NLCS MVP against the Yankees. Come your way Tuesday, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, right here on Fox. Strike two on Jeter. A lot of different things went into Joe Torre's decision to start Orlando Hernandez in the ball game tonight and save David Cohn for the first game in San Diego. You can never predict the weather in New York at this time of year, but Joe Torre was anticipating cooler weather. Felt it would be more beneficial for David Cohn to start in San Diego in the warm weather, and that coupled with the fact that Hernandez is eight and one here at Yankee Stadium four and three on the road this year made his decision fairly easy Dan Maselli who didn't work last night getting ready as Jeter hits a comeback or two. one six three for the double play the inning ending double play off the bat of Jeter nicely turned by the Padres through seven nine to one Yankees well, whenever the Goodyear blimp is hovering above with its camera focused on the event, you know you're going to get a unique view. Tonight, it's the spirit of Akron. You can find out more about the Goodyear blimps on the Internet at Goodyear.com. We welcome you back. Game two, eighth inning. The second pitcher of the night, Mike Stanton, the left-hander. After an overwhelming performance by Orlando Hernandez, seven innings, one run, seven strikeouts. Well, Joe Torre said he had a lot of confidence in the young man that he would not be overmatched in this situation and Hernandez certainly did not let his manager down tonight. Merv Rettman is the hitting coach for the San Diego Padres wearing a microphone for his hitters. He scouts the left hander Stanton. It says here off and on. Fast same stuff. Huh? Fastball, breaking ball, a change. Let's see. Stone will face. He's hot and cold. It threw hard in the series. Armed with that information, how can you not get a hit? <laughs> hot and cold, fastball, slider change. Go get him. Hit what you see. Caminiti hasn't done a lot of that. He's 0 for 3. He rips it down the left field line. Why not? After the scouting report, Caminiti has a ground rule double. Caminiti 1 for 4 tonight. Was 0 for 3 last night. That's his first World Series hit. Sometimes it's good to get back to good old-fashioned country hardball. Hit what you see. We've had Merv Renton and Mike throughout the postseason, and generally that's the advice he gives. Yeah, Go up that's there true. And look yeah. for a good pitch and hit it hard back up the middle of the field. Keep it simple. Here's Jim Layritz off the bench for San Diego facing Stanton. Some heat from the left hander for strike one. Joyner being lifted for the pinch hitter, Layritz. Seven postseason home runs in the short career of Jim Layritz. And seven postseason home runs. 48 at bats coming into last night's game. 52 coming into this at bat. Last night 0 for 4. Two balls and a strike. And Rivera getting loose in the San Diego dugout as Leritz. That's in front of Finley. Two balls, two strikes. 
Hard to believe a man with uh, the type of postseason success that Larritz has had has seen four different ball clubs since 96. The Angels, the Rangers, the Red Sox, and now San Diego. Larritz strikes out on a pitch inside, and that's the first out here in the top of the eighth. A cut fastball inside here from Mike Stanton. Starts on the inside part of the plate and just slides in a little bit enough to tie up Jim Lairitz on that inside part. So Lairitz, the pinch hitter, is gone and now with one on one out to batters Finley. We talked about it last night, Bob, the difference in the bullpen. San Diego with two. Left handers out in their pen, the Yankees with two in their pen. But Stanton a little different than what the Padres can throw at you with Randy Myers and Mark Langston. A little more velocity from Stanton. One of the left handed relievers out of that Yankees bullpen, Graham Lloyd, the other guy, more of a sinker slider type of a pitcher, more of a ground ball pitcher. Should Joe Torre need a double play ball in a tight situation? Stanton more of a fly ball strikeout pitcher. The 1 1. Strike 2. The man with two hats. Well, it won't rain on his ears, we know that. He did that or Napoleon impersonation. <laughs> Ball and two strikes on Finley. Another thing Stan will do is work inside. As he proved with Leyritz at the plate. See what he does with Finley. Under its second one out. Staying away, staying at one and two. Steve Finley, a pull hitter, 99 of his hits went to right field this year. That is a, an excellent point, a point brought out last night, that both Stanton and Graham Lloyd will work inside. The two left handers in the Padre bullpen, Randy Myers and Mark Langston, work away from left handed batters. The one two. Two and two. <laughs> We're getting to that point in the game, aren't we? Yes, we are. This is less is more in my book. Layout time. Two balls, two strikes, runner at second, one out. Full count. Ruben Rivera now on deck. Stanton gave up a leadoff double to Caminiti. Leyrich struck out. Finley with a full count. Slow roller to not block. The barehanded pick up for the out. Two gone in the Padre eighth. I didn't think Knobloch had a chance to get the speedy Steve Finley, but Knobloch using his speed right here in our super shot camera picks up the barehanded pickup. Boy, that is a nice play. That was not a softly hit ball. I mean, normally a bare hand is when the ball has almost stopped rolling or a high hopper. That ball was hit relatively hard and on a tough hop, and he made a great bare handed play. And now Ruben Rivera, the cousin of Mariano Rivera, who got the save in last night's game and is the closer for Joe Torre's Yankees. Strike one. Ruben Rivera, part of the Hideki Arabu deal. One ball, one strike is Mariano Rivera. Ruben's cousin looks on from behind the wall in the Yankee bullpen.
into left field. Pretty well hit. Back is Lede at the wall off the top of the wall. In to score is Caminiti. Holding it second with an RBI double, Ruben Rivera, and it's a 9-2 Yankee lead. I know you can hear me. Three more feet, and that ball's out of here. Almost. Ruben Rivera's first World Series at bat. He almost hit it to his cousin in that Yankee bullpen yeah. out there. Yeah, Ruben Rivera got off to a great start this year. See that ball hitting at the very top of the left field fence. I said three feet. Try three inches. <laughs> I mentioned Rivera got off to a great start this year, and then his name was mentioned as a possible trade candidate to acquire Randy Johnson. Padres did not want to give up Ruben Rivera, a five-tool player that they envision as perhaps their center fielder of the future, and he said that after that time, he put a lot of pressure on himself to produce. Finished the season very slowly, hitting under 200 the last two months. Carlos Hernandez now off the bench, takes a strike batting for Greg Myers. Third pinch hitter of the inning for Bruce Bochy and the Padres. One run in, seven run Yankee lead. Ruben Rivera at second with two out in the 0-1 to Carlos Hernandez. One ball, one strike. Those five tools, by the way, hit, hit for power, run, throw, and field. Nobody had better tools in those areas, in my opinion, than Willie Mays, best player I ever saw. One ball, one strike. Big swing by Hernandez, strike two. The five-tool category, I don't think you'd get much argument no. selecting May. Graham Lloyd and Jeff Nelson now getting loose in the Yankee bullpen. Two balls, two strikes. The masked Yankee Avenger. I saw that guy outside our hotel last night. Really? I'd like to see our production crew put catcher cam on that mask. <laughs> two balls, two strikes. Hernandez down the left field line. Lede into the corner. Ah, it's a foul ball. Not a lot of room down in that corner for a ball to be foul and still stay in the ballpark. Not a lot of room in this ballpark down the lines for two umpires to stand down there. Clearly foul is called by Jerry Crawford. And another pretty good five tool player here for the Yankees and Mantle. Probably the top two there, Mays and Mantle. That five tool player category. You could throw Henry Aaron in that category too. When he was younger, he could throw and run with the best of them. Here's the 2 2 to Carlos Hernandez. Back up the middle. Now block over the bag. Another bare hand, but he can't get the out. What he did do was save a run, and it's first and third with two out on an infield hit by Carlos Hernandez. With a seven-run lead in the eighth inning, Knobloch can take a chance on the bare hand play here and try to throw Hernandez out at first. In a closer ball game, you would anticipate him trying to knock that ball down, mm -hmm. keep it in the infield. Great effort to throw just a little bit to the outfield side there to Tino Martinez. Asking Derek Jeter if he had it. I don't think either would have been able to get the out. And now first and third with two down for Chris Gomez. He has two hits tonight. The ball low. Coming up on 11 o'clock in the Eastern time zone. The Padres with 
One run in, two men on, trailing nine to two in game two. Lost game one. Joe Torre makes his way out of the dugout, and Mike Stanton stands there with his hands on his hips. We will have a pitching change. We're in the top of the eighth inning. Third pitcher of the night for the Yankees coming on with New York leading by seven. Good year is Jeff Nelson. Who as we mentioned last night had to prove he was healthy with a bulging disc in his back. Had to prove it over the last month. Is in back to back games here in the World Series. It's two thirds of an inning in last night's ball game in relief of David Wells gave up a hit a run. Struck out a batter, walked a batter. Here's Mark Sweeney now as Joe Torre went to the right hander Nelson. Sweeney gets his first World Series at bat as he comes off the bench to hit for Gomez. David, David. Wells in the well. Last night's starter and winner for the Yankees. Now Nelson deals and Sweeney gets a base hit to right. And to score is Rivera. Stopping at second is Hernandez, and it's a 9-3 Yankee lead. You can charge that run to Stanton, still responsible for Hernandez on base. And Sweeney did not wait around long in his first World Series at bat. We know Knobloch has range to his left. Gets sprawled out there. Ball just tips off the very end of the thumb of his glove. Maximum effort guy right there. There's Stanton watching as Nelson. Come on, Q. Works to the seventh hitter of this inning for San Diego. Leadoff man, Kilvio Veras. Two on, two out. Harris one hit tonight one RBI Hernandez and Sweeney aboard for the Padre strike two from Nelson for the first time in a while this crowd makes some noise as the Padres They've already scored two and have a chance for more. Vera is still 0 2. Mariano Rivera starting to stir around a bit down in that Yankee bullpen. Vera is set up at 0 2. Taken care of by Jeff Nelson. Bottom of the eighth inning, Yankees lead by six. Welcome back to Yankee Stadium. We move to the bottom of the eighth inning of game two. Ruben Rivera stays in the game in left field. Andy Sheets is the new shortstop as the Padres pinch hit for Chris Gomez. Jim Leritz now at first base. He pinch hit for Wally Joyner. Carlos Hernandez stays in the game. He behind the plate, catching the new right-hander, Dan Maselli. Maselli getting an inning of work here in tonight's ball game. Tim and I speculated between innings that perhaps Trevor Hoffman would get yeah. some work in the ball game tonight. Hasn't pitched since game six of the NLCS. Right back up the middle, and Paul O'Neill gets his first hit of the series. How many balls up the middle have we seen sneak through the infield off Yankee bats tonight? Well, it just reinforces the fact of what a good hitting team this Yankees club is. Almost every hitting coach in the world will tell you it all comes off of that swing back up the middle. Everything works off of that swing. Not unusual to see the Yankees bunch those hits up the middle of the field. 
fundamentally sound to drive that shoulder right back through the pitcher. That's the image the good hitters have. Here's Bernie Williams. Bernie's popped a home run tonight, one out of four at the end of tonight's game. Bob, Tim, and I will select the Chevy truck player of the game. You can see Bernie Williams right there, closing his shoulders. George Kissel, the great Cardinal instructor, used to talk about hitting like highway construction. Closed shoulders. <laughs> Two and oh. But you can see a lot of a lot of hitters doing that though they keep reminding themselves keep the right shoulder tucked in if you're a left-handed batter the left shoulder if you're a right-handed batter and this team does it as well as any in baseball three and0 now from Maselli who has been the eighth inning setup man from the right side for Trevor Hoffman this season last night Bruce Bochy Brought in Downey Wall in the seventh inning, and then Langston each gave up home run. Wall to not block, and Langston to Tino Martinez. Three and one now on Bernie Williams. Dan Maselli, fourth pitcher of the night for San Diego. Outside corner, three and two. Lead off hit by O'Neill. He's running on three and two, and Williams fouls it away. So with nobody out in a three-two count, the Yankees start O'Neill at first. Bernie Williams looking for his second hit of the night. Fifth at bat. Runner goes again, and Williams fouls another. O'Neill with some words for Varis. It looked like Varis may have said something as the Yankees start the runner leading by six here in the eighth inning. And knowing the Yankees are going to start the runner at first base, I'm surprised Jim Leyertz has not moved around into a better defensive position, play right behind the runner, and then back off to give yourself a little more range on that right side. And a foul tip, a painful foul tip for Carlos Hernandez. Looked like uh, it not only caught the chest protector, but the right wrist of Hernandez, who is nursing. Hit him on the left foot. It hit everything like a pinball machine back there. <laughs> now that's when a catcher is most exposed. When you come up out of that crouch and try to get yourself into a good position to receive and throw the ball, many times you uh, expose unpadded areas yeah. to that foul tip. O'Neill should go again. This time he stays put. And Williams fouls it back. Might be tired. <laughs> A look at Trevor Hoffman. Who has been inactive in the first two games of this World Series. Here's the role of the DH. Greg Vaughn even with his teammates in the field sitting there with his helmet on getting ready to hit. Second in the ninth inning. Not close ball four, a single a walk. And the Yankees have two on with nobody out. Chili Davis walks in. The producer of the 1998 World Series is John J. Filippelli, assisted by Michael Weissman. The director is Bill Webb, and the segment producers are Carol Langley and Lance Garrett. The game producer is Gary Lang, and the senior producer of Fox Sports is Bill Brown. The executive producers of Fox Sports, David Hill and Ed Gorin. Special thanks, as always, to Kathy Hunt, Scott Ackerson, Jim Lynch, Scott McQuaid, Jerry Steinberg, Joe Carpenter, Jeff Morello, Peter Sultans, Steve Horn again up here in the booth. Two on, nobody out, and a ball to Chili Davis. The 
Deki Arabu getting ready for the ninth inning. Two and zero as Maselli is really struggling. Rabu, by the way, if he enters in the ninth inning, and it would make all the sense in the world, would be in the postseason for the first time. Last year was inactive. This year has been on the active roster, but unused. Three and zero from Maselli to Chili Davis. Lead off hit by O'Neill, a walk to Bernie Williams and the 3-0 pitch. Not close, ball four to load him up. Well, Bob, we came on the air tonight talking about this Padre bullpen, which during the regular season was a strength. As Tino Martinez will get another crack at a grand slam. But this bullpen has been exposed here in the postseason, with the exception of Trevor Hoffman. Trevor Hoffman, and before tonight, Brian Bowringer had done a nice job out of the bullpen for the Padres, but as we chronicled at the top of the show that is going to be a continuing problem for Dave Stewart and Bruce Bochy throughout this World Series unless they can get more innings from their starting pitching. But the Yankees offense is going to have something to say about that as we saw in the ball game tonight working a lot of deep counts they ran up the pitch count on Andy Ashby early in the ball game and Bruce Bochy with no choice but to go to those long relievers in the bullpen. Homer Bush now running at first base for Chili Davis. It's Homer Bush from East St. Louis, Illinois, makes his first World Series appearance. And here is Tino Martinez, who hit a grand slam in game one. That's down the right field line, hooking foul, strike one. Doubly dangerous when you take a guy like Martinez knowing that the pitcher Dan Maselli just threw four straight balls now looking in the middle of the plate trying to hop on that fastball that he knew was coming and just pulled it foul. One ball one strike. No player has ever hit two grand slams in World Series play. Tino Martinez a chance. A ball and two strikes from Maselli. Seven runs, seventh inning capped on this grand slam by Tino Martinez in game one. Made it a nine to five game at the time of the Yankees won last night, nine to six. That's off the plate. Maselli will come home for the first out of the inning. Everybody moves up one station. Bases loaded one away. And a force out scored one two. Sinking fastball from Maselli. Tino Martinez just hits the top half of the ball. Chops it back to the mound. Post ball game you'd see Paul O'Neill come streaking in there and try to break up two at home plate. As a base runner with the bases loaded a force play at the plate. You're taught to go in there and try to flip the catcher just as you would a second baseman or shortstop in the middle infield. Mark Langston now getting ready. He's the one that gave up the grand slam to Tino Martinez last night. As Brocious, who was three out of four with three singles and RBI and a run scored, is at the plate with the bases loaded. One out now. The Yankees have scored nine runs and hit into three double plays tonight. So they've had base runners all over the place. Sally took too much time, so Brochers hops out. Strength from the selling. Thoughts about Daryl Strawberry and his colon cancer out of the hospital and at home expressed by Joe Torrey tonight. 
magnified in Scott Brocious's mind. His father detected with the same malady three months ago. Was planning on coming to the series, but unfortunately could not make it. And he's watching the game in McMinnville, Oregon. And how proud of Scott Brocious is the Brocious family coming off a year in which he hit 203. And we mentioned it last night, many on this Yankee Club feel. Of all the players, Brocious might be the MVP of a team that won 114 games during the regular season. American League record. Brocious strikes out. Two gone. So Maselli getting into trouble and trying to get out of trouble with Posada standing in his way. Jorge one hit tonight. That was a two run home run in the fifth. <laughs> Strike one. Tim Raines constantly stirring things up. Messing around with El Duque there on the bench. I don't even know if they can understand each other, but they're having a good time. Well, handshakes are the international language, and Tim Raines has 24 handshakes. One for each Yankee. <laughs> Tough to remember all those. Now when the rosters expanded, did he add to to, to the 40 man roster in September? Yeah. I didn't ask him that. Bases loaded two out. There are the runners aboard. Tim Raines, formerly known officially as Rock Raines. Back to Tim. The 1 1. Posada off the end of the bat into center for Steve Finley. And Maselli got into trouble. Bases loaded, nobody out. Got out of trouble. And we go to the ninth inning. Game two. Yankees in control, leading by six. Well, Jeff Nelson remains in the game. No Hideki Arambu. As we move to the ninth inning, the Yankees leading 9 to 3. And the Padres in their last chance will have Gwynn, Vaughn, and Caminetti to lead it off. Nine to three, New York here in game two. Last night the Yankees won nine to six. 18 runs in the first two games by the Yankees, who hit only 218 while winning the ALCS over Cleveland. Here's Gwynn. One out of three plus a walk. Side to Gwynn. Bad news for the Padres if you want to play percentages. 75% of teams taking a 2 0 lead in the history of the World Series. Gone on to win the World Series. One ball, one strike. But again, the New York Yankees trailed the Atlanta Braves two games to nothing going in their park in 1996. One good thing for the Padres, they go back home in front of it once again. One of the best crowds in the game. Tony Gwynn lines to short one away here in the top of the ninth. On the other side, if this series doesn't go six games, these fans here at Yankee Stadium might be looking at their Yankees who won 114 games during the regular season and are making a charge for their 24th World Championship. They might be looking at them in person in action for the final time unless this series gets back here next Saturday for game six a strength of on mentioned earlier in the ball game Jeff Nelson facing Greg Vaughn last night two sliders on the outside corner and a hard sinker on the fist broke his bat and he tapped back to the mound one ball one strike. It'll be a long flight home for San Diego. They fail to rally here in the ninth inning. But when they get there and after the travel day tomorrow, the curtain comes up on 
game three in San Diego. We mentioned it a couple of times, but because it's worth mentioning a couple of times, the home field advantage that the Padres enjoy at Qualcomm Stadium is as good as any home field advantage in baseball. Ball and two strikes on Greg Vaughn. To the left side, Brocious. What a pickup. Two gone. You spoke volumes with that one comment. What a pickup. Over from Oakland. He has just solidified that infield. That's the second out here in the ninth inning. And now Caminiti takes a strike. Caminiti with his first World Series hit in his last at bat, a leadoff double and a run scored last inning. One ball, one strike. The New York Yankees long methodical march toward a world championship continuing here in game two two balls and a strike on Caminiti Orlando Hernandez a rookie by Major League Baseball standards but not in experience with his history with the Cuban national team another strong start in the postseason now the Padres are down to their final strike. Caminetti a limp after that swing. I don't know if Caminetti remembers how to walk without something hurting. He is constantly in pain, it would seem. But from the looks of the area he grabbed, it appeared to be some kind of a groin injury. He suffered from a pulled groin throughout the majority of this season. Perhaps re-aggravated it. Certainly not. Yep. Yep, you're right, Bob. You can see him grab that right groin area. Here comes Bruce Bochy and the trainer for the Padres. Need a crane to drag Caminetti out of there, but that's exactly what it was. That groin area, no sense in, in a game like this, a game that's, for the most part, he said he's fine. That's enough. That's it. Now he's a little more adamant about being fine. Well, after initially straining the groin, it would seem on the first 2 2 pitch, that last swing, he didn't leave anything there. He just wailed away like nothing was wrong. Two out, nobody on, ninth inning, Yankees leading by six. Caminiti trying to extend this game too. Look at Brian Cashman, the Yankee general manager. Game over. And the Yankees are up two games to none.
Orlando Hernandez is tonight's Chevy truck player as he did in game four of the ALCS tonight. One run on six hits. Seven strikeouts in control from the start. And many fans hanging around in case this series doesn't go six. Giving a standing ovation for the many memories of 19. 98 the 114 regular season victories and now 123 wins all let's take you down now to the field and chip carry chip all right joe thank you very much we're here with yankee shortstop Derek jeter you're halfway home to your goal of another world championship but i know you and the rest of your teammates would agree there's still some work to be done a lot of work to be done if you recall in 1996 we were down two games we were able to come back so San Diego's not out of it. They're going to play as tough in their park, so we've got to come out and take game three like it's game seven. Hard to believe this could be the last game you play here at Yankee Stadium this season if all goes according to what the Yankees' plan would be, and that's closing this thing out in San Diego. I hope so. I mean, everyone would like to. We're trying to win it. You'd love to win it here, but, you know, we want to try to get it over with. This Yankee ball club is one that seemingly, when they get a break, you guys kick the door in. That's really been the story, I think, of the first two games of the series against San Diego. We've been doing it all year. Uh, you know, if a team makes a mistake, we've been able to capitalize on it. And that's what you have to do, especially when you're playing a team like the Padres. If they make any mistakes, you got to go out and take advantage of it because you're not going to have too many opportunities to score. Well, Derek, thanks for your time. We'll see you out in San Diego for game three. Thanks a lot. All right, Derek Jeter of the Yankees. They lead the World Series two games to none. Joe Buck, back to you. All right, Chip, thank you, and thank you to Derek Jeter, and congratulations to the Yankees. Up two games to none, but now the series goes out to California, San Diego, and rocking Qualcomm Stadium. After a travel day tomorrow, we get it back in gear on Tuesday night. Back with more after this. Two of